Good evening and welcome to the Town of Arlington Redevelopment Board meeting on December 18th, 2023. I'd like to call this meeting to order. My name is Rachel Zemberry. I am the chair of the Redevelopment Board and if the other members could please introduce themselves. Steve Revelock. Eugene Benson. Shana Corman Houston. Ken Lau. And we also have with us tonight uh, Claire Ricker, the director of the Department of Planning and Community Development. And uh, Claire, uh, would you like to introduce yes. your new colleague who is joining us this evening? I would love to introduce my new colleague. So the new um, assistant uh, director for planning and community development, Claire Suarez, is joining us this evening. Um, it's her first uh, redevelopment board meeting, um, and we are thrilled to have her. So, well, welcome. We are very, very much looking forward to working with you. Congratulations. Great. Um, so let's go ahead and move into our first agenda item this evening. We have a packed agenda and um, we will move through it as quickly as we can. Uh, so the first agenda item is the review of the meeting minutes from December 4th, 2023. I will first uh, ask if there are any uh, revisions or corrections from any member of the board, starting with Ken. No, I have none. Shana? No. Jean? I have none. And Steve? No changes, Madam Chair. I do not have any changes either. Is there a motion to approve the meeting minutes as submitted? So motioned. Is there a se second? Great, thanks. We'll take a roll call, call vote, starting with Steve. Yes. Jean? Yes. Shana? Yes. Ken? Yes. And I am a yes as well. Those meeting minutes have been approved. Moving on, um, we will move to the Conservation Commission proposed warrant article. Um, and I will turn it over to uh, Claire for an introduction. Thank you very much. So these are uh, two proposed warrant articles um, that have been vetted by the Conservation Commission um, to be uh, uh, progressed by DPCD and potentially the ARB um, uh, warrant articles uh, for, for zoning. One is related to the inland wetland district overlay. Um, and the other is a proposal for rezoning open space, which I think is uh, an item the board was interested in, in looking at um, anyway. So uh, I'd like to introduce uh, David Morgan, who's our environmental planner uh, and uh, conservation agent, and uh, he will walk us through um, the proposed uh, Warren articles. Fantastic, thank you, and thank you, David. Um, Steve, if I could ask you to please um, relocate that microphone, and if you and Jean wouldn't mind um, sharing, that would be fantastic. David, do you have any other guests that have joined you this evening? Chuck Taroni, Vice Chair of the Conservation Commission. Great, thank you. Great, and um, we'd love it if you could um, take us through the, the two articles. We can maybe start with the first and have discussion unless you'd like to do both of them and then have a discussion afterwards. Do the first one. Perfect. The Inland Wetland District. That sounds great. First, yeah. Um, so the Inland Wetland District has come up in recent redevelopment projects as sort of a question. Sure. <laughs> yes, and I, and I do apologize Basically. for anyone who is speaking this evening. The HVAC is a bit loud, so you do need to project over it a bit. We don't have um, microphones currently in the room that are projecting this evening. Thank you. So the Inland Wetland District has come up as a bit of a question mark recently <clears throat> in redevelopment projects. Um, the, the district is on the books as what I understand as a pre-Wetlands Protection Act way of achieving the same goals through zoning. And since then, of course, we've had almost 50, no, 50 plus years of the um, Conservation Commission and uh, State Wetlands Protection Act on the books, our local bylaw, of course. Um, it's been around many decades and very robust document. The concern with the Inland Wetland District is that it's principally outmoded fact is Conservation Commission supersedes on pretty much all fronts and so we, we've gone and checked with the Zoning Board of Appeals to see if it would be effective for them to continue having zoning oversight of the wetlands district. <coughs> Their feeling is that it's duplicative, we don't really need to have the wetland district on the books and more to the point, it's erroneous, let's say. <laughs> uh, the, the data that are suggested that the town holds uh, 
in the wetland district language is not actually represented in the zoning maps that we provide to the public, for example. So there's a lack of communication about what the definition of the district is in the first place that you know we're at present at least unable to communicate what this really means to the public. That's uh, of course a pretty easy thing to fix. We can just update maps and so forth, but I, I think our time would be better spent with the expertise of the commission being the, the go-to for all in the wetland concerns. And of course we have a robust permitting process established in town. The expertise of the commission is held in very high regard. We have a very uh, very well educated, very informed, very responsible commission. And inspectional services, ZBA, I would agree from where I sit in planning that uh, we're, we're all on the same page. We would like to just take it off the books. I don't think it makes sense to, to have in the zoning any longer. We gain no additional benefit from the zoning enforcement. We already have mechanisms for that via CONCOM. Yeah, hello, I'm uh, Chuck Taroni. I'm the Vice Chair of the Arlington Conservation Commission. And only to say that the Conservation Commission voted at its last meeting on December 7th to uh, support this unanimous. I have to uh, agree with everything David said about the zoning district. And I think where I've worked in two other communities where they also uh, abolished the zoning district left it up to the Conservation Commission. And so the Conservation Commission is very well capable of uh, managing the Wetlands Protection Act and the Town Wetlands Protection Bylaw and regulations. So Great. this is supported by the Commission. Fantastic. Seems pretty straightforward. I'll see if any of the members of the board have any questions on this first of two proposed warrant articles, starting with Ken. Um, I'm very supportive of what you guys said. I think it's time to shift over. I do have one tangential question to this, okay? And it has nothing to do with what you're speaking right now. Is <laughs> it loosely related? Yes. Okay. Uh, there's, a, there's a, I think it's called a no-name stream or river that runs through Arlington. Yes, yeah, no-name brook. No-name brook, okay? That, I'm not sure, is it ever wet? Or any? Yeah. yeah. It is? Maybe today. <laughs> Maybe today, okay. But, uh, but how's, how's, how's the commission addressing that? Because I know a few years back, someone did an addition, and it had to be taken down because of, it was within the setbacks of the brook. And it wasn't clearly identified. I mean, I believe the owner did everything right and they just somehow slip through the cracks. I just want to say, can we do something about that so it doesn't happen in the future, because it was a real shame. Yeah, so I don't know what uh, year that happened, but we have been working on our maps throughout the town, our GIS system, and when you go to the wetlands GIS maps for the town of Arlington, it casts a jurisdictional marker around all the properties that the Conservation Commission has to review. And this has helped not only homeowners and residents of Arlington, but the building department also, which uh, has increased their calls to the Conservation Commission to allow us to get a first look at some of these projects prior to them being built. So that we've, we've made some steps. I'm, I'm not sure what, when this happened, but that is very unfortunate. That, uh, I would that say I'm an old timer here, so uh, maybe Gene might know too. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it was probably eight maybe nine years ago mm -hmm. uh it was a bit it was uh, a pretty big you know i felt real bad for the homeowner yeah i'll have to look into that i don't it doesn't ring a bell uh, oh, but it, it's it's the no name brook that and it's uh, their backyard right there they did a family room addition okay mm -hmm. i just want to make sure that so, there's somehow clear enough <coughs> information that uh, that this doesn't happen again that's all i'm saying Absolutely, yes. It's mapped currently, and we're doing a study of it with CPA dollars to see how we can enhance that 
Okay, and there is a certain a short list where they can go through saying, hey, you know, if you fall within these criteria, here's here are the certain things you have to sort of follow. Yep. And it's not sharp, but yes. <laughs> and these are people you got to contact to make sure you're within, you know, it's, it's a little small checklist is all I'm asking. Yeah, uh, I, I think there's a there's definitely a checklist and it certainly is reviewed. You know, as, as these places become known, um, it's, it becomes more obvious to the building department, to all the departments, to understand that, they, you know, they remember stories like you just told us, and so no name verb would probably be looked at a lot more and remembered by not only all the neighbors, but the, the first stop is the building department. Everyone in town realizes for many years that they need a building department permit to do any kind of work. The same is not true with conservation permits, so that surprise is built in. And so we have to intercept that prior to what happened here, which was the foundation, the permitting process, a review. I mean, there was a lot of time spent there that the Conservation Commission wasn't aware of this project. And unfortunately, it probably wouldn't have been allowed uh, if it was you know, asked to be removed. So it's, it's good to check all the boxes prior to, uh, you know, for the town and for all the committees. You know, same normal way just to make sure that they're heading in the right direction. Thank you. Great. Uh, Shana. <clears throat> um, I, I think this is, this is likely a, a uh, great path to be going down. It does seem to make a lot of sense to me. Are there areas um, that the removal of the district would, um, would leave unprotected or less protected that, that CONCOM um, does not have in its purview but the district does? So the answer to that has to be yes and no, and I'm not trying to do a delicate dance here. <laughs> but you are. <laughs> but, but the fact of how it's defined currently is kind of no man's land. Mm -hmm. And if strictly interpreted, there may be places where this applies, but CONCOM doesn't have jurisdiction, but it doesn't have a formal definition that works. And so I think any tweak that we would make to it in order to correct it, like if we were going to go that route instead, we would wind up aligning it with the Comms <coughs> jurisdiction. It's similar to the floodplain district. It's, those are overlapping entirely. Okay. Thank you. Great clarification. Thank you for the question. Gene. Yeah, I have two or three questions. One was related to Shana's question about whether there's not a perfect overlap between the two. So the current inland wetland district um, is, is for a horizontal distance distance of 200 feet from the center line of any perennial river, brook, or stream. So I'm just wondering what the Conservation <coughs> Commission <coughs> jurisdiction is. Is it 200 feet or is it less? For, for a stream, it would be, so for a perennial stream, it would be 200 feet. So it's the same. South. And for uh, uh, intermittent stream, it would be 100 feet from the top of the bank. Okay. So this doesn't have intermittent streams in here? Well, it sounds like in that situation, the worst case scenario would be uh, 200 feet. So, if you had an inland wetland district on a intermittent stream, you're casting 100 more feet than you need to. So, um, maybe this is. You yeah, know, this is just perennial. It doesn't deal with intermittent oh, okay. streams okay. at all. So, my second question is: In the past few years, has there anything that hasn't gotten to the conservation commission? But the building inspectors gotten something and said, oh, wetland <coughs> district, therefore I can't do something, and sends it to the Conservation Commission. Because this is sort of overlaps a lot with your jurisdiction, I agree. But I just wonder if there are times where, because the building inspector implements this, but he doesn't implement your regulations, if this is sometimes an entree into wetland regulations. I think that would be a great conversation starter with David and the building inspector. So 
Dave, you may know of a few that where that happened? No, I, I don't. I, I'm not aware of any circumstances where the building inspector caught in the Wetland District. And then yeah, I, I, I'd be interested in having a conversation with uh, head of inspectional services to, sure. to make sure that's the case, because I just think this is a really good idea, but I just want to make sure that we're not losing something important in the process. I mean, needless to say, that conversation should happen all the time, even when there's you know, just a perception that there may be, uh, you know, no name brook ends at some point. What is the next three houses? And maybe David and the building commissioner wants to talk about those just to make sure that they're not in that, the conservation's jurisdiction. It all starts with communication. Yeah. So my other question is, in addition to the Inland Wetland District overlay in the zoning bylaw, we also have a floodplain district overlay. How come you're not coming to us asking us to get rid of that too? Floodplain overlay district is required by law okay. for, in order to participate in the National Flood Insurance Program and uh, so on and so forth. There, there are many eligibility requirements that necessitate floodplain district. I very likely will be coming back to you in the future to change the language of the floodplain district because mm -hmm. uh, FEMA told us back in June or July of this year that they were going to update their flood maps. Mm -hmm. And with that process, when they finally get back around to individual municipality conversations, um, they suggest tweaks to the zoning language for the floodplain district municipality so that's on the horizon okay thanks that's all my question great thank you gene steve so just as a as a, as a little bit of history um arlington rehotified its zoning by a lot in 2017 and 2018 and one of the points of discussions was how to handle these two overlay districts and the overlap with the conservation commission uh, the conservation commission's jurisdiction and what we tried to do at the time was to sort of separate separate wetland stuff from use stuff so that the you know what was in the zoning bylaw uh, dealt with land uses and everything else you know went to the conservation commission's jurisdiction rereading this section there's not a whole necessarily a whole lot of substance in terms of land use so um i, I agree that um you know the conservation commission is you know you guys are a very bunch of bright dedicated people who know what you're doing um, and you are completely capable of, of, of handling this stuff. Uh, so I'm, I'm generally supportive of um, removing it. Great, thank you, Steve. And I am um, supportive as well. I did make the note to follow up with uh, Mike Champa and the um, NISD about the question that um, Jean asked regarding whether there are any cases that the building department would have caught because of the overlay rather than um, the other vehicles that you've already provided to them um, when they know to call CONCOM for, for a review, uh, just to make sure that we can all effectively answer that question um, when, it, when it comes in front of town meeting. Great. Um, any other questions before I ask them about the second proposed article? Great. Let's move on to the second article. All right. So there are a total of 68 districts sorry, not districts, parcels in Arlington where we've identified open space as the principal use, yet they are zoned many different, uh, they're in different districts. They can be residential, post development, I mean, it, it doesn't matter, they're all across the board. <coughs> but the thing that unites them, of course, is that they are open space so these range from the cemeteries, for example, to uh, parks and playgrounds, recreation properties, conservation properties, etc. And following the open space recreation plan and the public land management plan that identified the owners and managers of all of these parcels, we would like to shift the zoning to reflect the use, and we'll have a later conversation about who owns and who manages.
changes which pieces. This is sort of the first step in that direction. And as you will all be familiar, open space designation comes with pretty heavy use restrictions. So the way that I've gone about identifying these parcels is first to look at our open space and recreation plan inventory. Compare that with the existing zoning map and find the discrepancies. And then anything else that fits the definition of uh, open space in this open space district section of the bylaw, specifically saying that structures are ancillary to the principal use, which is open space, I've added a few in that meet those criteria and have been identified by others as open space parcels. So, I, I think that's really the long and short of it. I think cleaning up the, the zoning in this regard would benefit the town to know what it has, to be able to do the count effectively each time we need to account for all of our open space to better, as I said earlier, assign responsibilities in light of open space zoning you know, or improve efficiencies in terms of management and use and so forth. And I put together a, a list of the properties in question. There are 15 that are loosely themed around recreation those are mostly zoned R1 and R2. We also have 18 that are used for conservation purposes. Uh, R1, multi-use, plan unit development, or R0 currently. I broke out a separate segment of cultural and historic uses. Uh, these are ones with you know, historical significance course, or they might actually be, there, there's one odd one in this category that's the little park right next to the high school where it was, um, I forget the name of the condos that are right next to the high school there, but they put this in as open space and a constructed wetland back there. That is a cultural use in my designation. There are four properties that are privately held. Those are mostly affiliated with like Bedford Boat Club or the Winchester and Belmont Country Clubs. There's also one conservation restriction owned by the Warden family. These are all zoned R0 or R1. And I've already mentioned the, the cemeteries. There are four of those properties, totaling eight parcels. The Recreation uh, Park and Rec Committee has supported, voted support this uh, rezoning, likewise for conservation and uh, open space committee all in support of this. The cemetery commission has questions about you know, what it really means and how they'd like to proceed, so I would recommend further engagement with them if you all decide to take this up. But I think I'll stop there. And if there are any questions, just... Great, thank you. Um, first, my first question is, uh, do you have a map Absolutely. currently of this? Yeah. And is that something that maybe we could follow up with the board? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and my second question is, is there a map that overlays the current open space plan um, to see, I'm assuming some of yeah. these are included in the open space plan and some of them are not? Right. Okay, that, those are the two um, questions that I have. I'll go to Ken. Uh, two quick questions. I, I think I also agree with this so far. Uh, except for your five districts, I have issues with only one of the districts, okay. and that is the private uh, one. Um, right now, you know, the, the boating club, the, the yacht club, or the uh, country club, and all that stuff there it is. If they ever close or if they ever decide to uh, change, it would become open space. Uh, it, it would be zoned as open space, so nothing can happen to it besides what's there. And I think that is a shame. 
Um, I really think golf clubs are the worst uh, <laughs> land use in anything and everything that goes through EPA. Uh, waste of money, waste of land, everything, okay? So, and I would hate to turn that back to open space. Uh, you know, we have a, uh, we have a few beautiful water edge we could, that could always be uh, developed for, for other people. I mean, I would definitely not leave it as R0, R1, where you put mansions up there. I would definitely like to see if we can change that to a higher uh, R value so there could be more people that can live there and, and share if this, if these things ever change. So that's the only thing I would take out of that, say let's look at this some more and see if we can do something in that four properties or nine parcels or whatever, saying that's, let's use that uh, open space. I guess you could call it open space. It's not really an open space, but it is because it's not shared by everybody. It's private open space. So, you know, and I would like to make it so, such that where it could become public or uh, be more for, uh, for, the, for the town where it could be more housing there, you know, and it could be uh, a full range, not just rich mansions there where there's like five or six of them plopped there along there because it's R0 and R1. If you increase it to R6 or something like that, then you, then you have um, a density there where you can increase and make it so that everybody can live there. And, or at least an opportunity for people to live there, okay? I'll leave it at that. And then, uh, does this include uh, the open space that we have right now in, Gene, you help, you help me with this. Is it in Belmont? We have this, uh, we, we lease this land from... Um, the Great Meadows? Yes, oh, Great Lex Meadows. That's Lexington. Lexington. We can't Lexington. zone Lexington. No, 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 but does that, but that's open space. Do we count that as part of ours or theirs? <laughs> or is, is it nothing? I'm not sure what Lexington does and whether they're double counting, but we do count it as Arlington's. So we do count that, what we lease as open space for us. We own it, we don't lease it. Oh, so we own it, but we don't, do we count that as open space for, uh, okay, I don't, I've never seen it in any thing saying, you know, we have limited open space. I think it's in the open space plan that we reviewed Did it? most recently. And yes. I missed it, okay. That's okay. We had a little bit of a discussion. That's the only reason I remember that one. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it, it's a great place to bike. It is. Okay. Uh, and walk. Okay. <laughs> I'm not there yet. <laughs> That's all I had. Okay. Thank you, Ken. Shana. Um, I think Ken makes an important <laughs> distinction between the public and the private open space. And, I would worry about the burden on individual property owners. Um, uh, I think there is a lot of value in clarifying uh, the parcels, clarifying the zoning of the parcels, but, um, but I agree that uh, leaving, out, leaving out privately held parcels uh, might have value for slightly different reasons than Kim does. Um, so right now, when I find it, our definition of open space district includes parcels under the jurisdiction of a number of things, doesn't mention private owners, right? So if we were to do this, we would also need to change the definition of open space district to include private ownership, but it also says structures where present are clearly accessory to the principal open space and recreation function of the properties. And I think there are a number of properties here where the primary use is not the open space, but the primary use is the house, such as Jason Russell House, where the primary use is the house. It's not the, the land in, in front of it. Um, the Medford Boat Club, where it's mostly building and places for the boat and not very much open space. I say that's the opposite of what um, is currently in the definition. Um, I think a few months ago at one of the meetings, I said, gee, I wonder why the cemeteries are zoned you know, residential. And I don't know if that was one of the impetuses for this. But when I got this, I did some research about that. 
And what I found, not for Arlington, but in general, that most cemetery areas ended up being zoned residential because when places were growing and they were like, where are we going to put things? They decided we don't want the cemeteries in industrial areas. We don't want the cemeteries in commercial areas. So they tended to zone them to be in residential areas. So, so then I looked at what is the current zoning of cemeteries. And I obviously couldn't look everywhere, but I just looked for some general information. And in many places, they're still zoned residential. In some places where they're not zoned residential, they're zoned specifically for cemetery with a definition of what cemetery is that includes burials and crematoria and things like that that we have in our definition. And I found very few that were actually zoned as open space. So I think that, especially since the cemetery commission has some questions, I think it may be worth considering speaking with them and maybe looking at setting up a separate district called cemetery for them and creating a definition of what a cemetery district would be. So I think we should um, think about that. The private properties, <clears throat> I guess I have, I have a couple things with the private property owners. We can certainly ask to rezone someone's property without their permission, but we should certainly ask them what they think about this and whether they'd be interested in going ahead or not. Um, and sort of building on what Ken and Shana said, the problem legally with zoning somebody's property as open space is then you've taken away all economic value that they have for the property and it amounts to a taking and they could theoretically sue the town for a taking and the town would either need to rezone right or the town would have to pay the for the economic value of the property that they've lost so i have a little concern about the constitutional um, problem, potential problem, let's say, in rezoning private property for open space for those reasons. And also, I know at least one it says has a conservation restriction, but those can be lifted, you know, so they're not forever. So it's not as if there's a conservation restriction they can always be open. That's a reason to make them open space, perhaps, but it also would allow them at some point to say, you know, we'd like to make an economic use of the property. If you don't let us do that, look at all these wonderful US Supreme Court cases that say we can sue and get money. So I have some concern about the private properties, both because the boat club doesn't really meet the definition of open space. Um, I couldn't find where that conservation restriction, I think the, what the information said it was on Brantwood Road. And I looked up and down Brantwood Road because I live nearby and I couldn't, it's somewhere, but I didn't know where it was. So, and I couldn't find it. I looked at the assessor's database, couldn't find it there either. I don't know where it is. It would be sort of spot zoning that little place. Spot zoning's not necessarily illegal, but it does raise that concern also about in a residential neighborhood just spot zoning a little place. So I, I like the idea of the recreation places in general. Um, I like the idea of the current conservation places in general, but I think I would want to look at each one individually and sure. see if they make sense. Historic cultural you know what some, this is the other thing I looked up, what, what some communities have done for those things is rather than zone them as open space, they zone them as um, public administrative space or governmental space or something like that. So they're not specifically seen as open space, which is more open spaces with not much on them, but something that you know, like, which might be appropriate for Monument Park, Jason Russell House, things like that. So we might want to take a look if that's a better designation for some of them. Um, 
than open space. So maybe we need a cemetery zone for the cemeteries. Probably that would make sense at this point. Um, we might need um, some sort of public realm zone for the historic cultural ones that are public. I'm not sure what to do with the private ones, um, but it would be worth having some conversation, I think, with them about that. And, um, and then maybe the others would fit into an open, play, open space zone, but I'd want to look at every, each one of them and see. Christina, That's where I am on that I now. I wanted to uh, let you know that most conservation restrictions we try to in perpetuity, and there's a tax benefit I know. when you go into one of those. So it, it might line up a little bit better in open space than when we first look at it. So, but I did like the other points you made. When I wasn't unaware, I was unaware of the Medford Boat Club. It's mostly structure, so that, that's interesting. And golf, well, I well, 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 the other side, but the golf areas, don't they just sell off some part of their land? Well, you know, you know what I think was interesting housing? about the golf area? I, I asked somebody, like, so what part of the, I don't, I don't belong to the Winchester oh, really? Poultry Club, by the way, but I did ask somebody, sort of what parts in Arlington, is this correct? They said it's the parking lot. So if it's the parking lot, if that's correct, does it make sense to have the parking lot it's more be zoned up in space? Several holes in our Several office. holes in the parking lot. So we need to think about whether, you know, it makes sense to zone a parking lot as open space, and although maybe there are a few holes in the Gene, I believe it's more than half, half the well, let's get the let's get the map, which is something yeah. we've right. requested, right. and then yeah. we can so, certainly review so that. So I think we're headed in a really good direction with this, but I think we look, need to look at the things that I talked about. Great. All good thoughts. I want to go back to your Sorry, first just, just before you answer, can I just um, remind everybody to please project for everybody who has joined us this evening? Thank you. Um, Thank you. No problem. The definition that you mentioned at the outset where it says jurisdiction of park and rec or concom is not factual <laughs> conservation commission's jurisdiction extends into myriad private properties i mean it, we're talking about ownership and management here not jurisdiction and so i think we want to clarify that in the definition I was also anticipating this question about the cemeteries in that space like the, of the definition to say maybe it's also of the cemetery commission, but I hear your points about cemeteries, that history is very interesting and <coughs> obviously they need to chime in with their two cents. Yeah, it, it doesn't say that every property in the jurisdiction of the conservation commission is open space. What it says is the reverse, which is some open space is in the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission. I'll take your word for it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, it's a little vague, but that's, yeah. I think, the better way to read it. Great. Thank you, Gene. Steve. Thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll start by uh, agreeing with Mr. Benson regarding the, the way we have the definition of open space district in our bylaw, you know, where structures are clearly accessory. And I agree with him that a lot of the historic properties, like the Jason Russell House, the structure is is you know is the main feature of the parcel. Um, I was wondering, in the I, I did look at the map linked in your memo, and are there cases where the proposed district is not the dis, proposed district boundaries are not coincident with parcel boundaries? Shouldn't be. I drew that from. Data from okay. It looked okay. There, I, I went back and forth. One of the features of our of our current map is that the district boundaries lie on are basically defined in terms of parcel boundaries. So you have a parcel that's in one district, um, and there were some that there were a number of them where uh, what I saw on the uh, the ArcGIS map didn't line up with. Um, didn't line up with them. For example, uh, behind the high school, it looked like the playing field was sort of designated as an open dis open space district, but that's only part of the parcel. Uh, the same thing with the multi-use district. Um, 
you know, around Arlington 360, and I guess it's a senior living center lower lower on the hill. Um, I mean, that that's one thing about our, our bylaw that I like, but it's you know, it's not a it's not a, a deal breaker to me. Uh, but going back to schools, have you had any conversations with the school department, with either the school department or the school committee about this? Great question. I have not since the park and rec folks tend to manage those spaces anyway. I went directly to them. And again, this is coming out of public land management plan and trying to align those uses with you know, the owner, ownership and management of said parcels. So um, I did not go to the school, but I think it's good. So like, one can, the consideration or the, the con concern I had in mind was um, periodically you know there a few years ago we had a big demographic shift in East Arlington a bunch of older families moved out younger families moved in um, and these the school school district needed to add I think six classrooms to one school and four to another but if you you know so having the like the playground the outdoor area is not zoned as open space gives the school district more flexibility where you know in order to, to deal with that sort of thing. So I I would like to them to weigh in specifically in, on that. Um, Can I just interrupt the Hardy School is a really good example yes. of that where they refigured the area, they moved things around, so mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, um, so regarding um, the planned unit development district, um, I, you, I'm, Personally, for speaking for myself, I would not want to do anything with that while um, Thorndike Place is still in the process of going through permitting. And until I know there is, you know, there is an agreement to be reached regarding the disposition of the non-developed portion. Um, until that dust settles, I, 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 I'm kind of leery on, you know, making any changes to that district. And. Um, I think that's all. Yeah, and finally, I also had the same concern as Mr. Benson, where if um, rezoning private land would basically be considered uh, a taking, and you know where the owner would be entitled to compensation from us. Um, so, just one more thing to think through. Thank you. Uh, I just have one thing to add, and then I'll come back to, to you, Gene. So, um, once you know. Uh, Gene uh, provides his comment. I can kind of recap, and then we'll see if there's any other um, conversation. But I just wanted for the board us to be thoughtful of this in, in reviewing this as well, um, given that we are currently undoing <laughs> um, some zoning that was whatever is currently on the parcel mm -hmm. becomes mm -hmm. the zone. Um, you know. That's what happened in the 70s, and we are actively undoing that work right now. So that's one of the reasons why I asked for the overlay of the open space plan with, with these spaces, because I think if the town has planned for um, better and higher uses of some of these places, some of which are not currently zoned as open space, that that makes, to me, perfect sense to, um, to move those into this plan. But for those that... Um, happen to be open space and um, but perhaps have not been contemplated as planned open space use within the town um, I would ask more questions about the, the why now and um, should that be part of the plan not to say that those couldn't potentially um, be added in the future just like we look at what the appropriate size and scale of zones are um, not regularly, but you know, not infrequently within within the town as well. So that's the only thing I wanted to mention to the board, given again the um, work that we're currently engaged with. The, the the one thing I forgot to mention is, I wonder if you've talked to the assessor's office about whether this rezoning <coughs> would change any of the assessments on any of the land that's not oh, I that currently that owned yes. <laughs> owned by the town. Um, you know, for example, I don't know, have any idea how we tax the part of Winchester Country Club that's in Arlington, but, and I don't know the answer, that's why I'm interested in the assessor. If that part were rezoned to open space, would the tax, tax assessment go down? 
would we lose tax revenue from doing that? Same thing, I don't think we're going to the Medford Boat Club with this, but for all of the things that are not government or private nonprofit, but things that are taxed, what's the taxing implication of these? Great question. Sorry, I forgot that. No, I had that one written down and I forgot to <laughs> ask it as well. So thank you for bringing that up for both of us. Uh, can, can I just interject? Please. It's kind of anecdotal, but it's funny we've talked about Medford Boat Club numerous times yes. in this conversation. The piece of it that is actually <clears throat> proposed in, in the map here is that section of the dam that is just east of the actual boat club. And <laughs> so that essentially does function as open space. I mean, it's it builds, but it is, you know, it's that nice mural with the fish and so forth on the ground. And it, it's a place that people go for scenic vistas. And, you know, it's not like you're actually getting in a boat right there. So just I've, I've been there many times. Yeah. Yeah. Does it include the parking lot that's just outside of it? No. I thought the parking lot so was so just that paved the area. Parking lot to the start of the actual dam. There's sort of that. Okay. <laughs> I can't describe it in other terms. No, no, I know exactly what you're talking about. Great. Yeah. Any other comments from the board? Uh, great. So at this time, um, we will open um, up for uh, public comment, noting that we are, uh, this is not a hearing. We are just taking um, any co uh, comments that may um, impact our discussion um, and feedback to um, the representatives who are here this evening. So any, uh, any members of the public wishing to speak on either of these two proposed uh, Warren articles? Please. For the, when you uh, and I'm sorry, <laughs> if I could ask you to please um, come, anybody who does speak this evening, please come and sit at this table here, speak into the microphone, and please introduce yourself by first and last name, and you will have up to uh, three minutes to address the board. Thank okay. you. Hi, uh, my name is Barry Jasper, and I live on Campbell Road. Um, regarding the, the Inland Wetlands District, you're describing, you described how, I, I think you said, that it was kind of vague, maybe contradictory in places. I just want to clarify. It would be useful when you were, we were discussing, like, in what way would removing that enlarge or reduce or change in some way the total protection of wetlands relative to what the CONCOM has. And you said sort of yes and no, there would be some, because, like, it's vague, right? And so it would, be, it would be really useful to say, maybe take the zoning district, the most expansive interpretation of what the zoning district could be, and then say, okay, if we take it away and CONCOM ends up with what it already has, here are the things that would change. Here are the things, that, the, the protections for wetlands that would go away. That would give a, a really clear view. Like that list would be big, it would be small, it would be whatever it is, and then we could evaluate it. Whereas, as a member of the public, like, I have no idea at the moment, based on what you said. Great. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, anyone else wishing to speak? Grant Cook, 16, Wollaston. And I'll echo, I think, something you already brought up in this topic about rezoning to open space is if we read in the paper a week from now that the Winchester Country Club was disposing of its land to move to another peat dye course to be built up in Carlisle, hmm. and 40 acres fell into the town's lap, to say that it would only be a for new Sherwood Forest, I think, would be foolhardy. Almost as foolhardy as it's turning it into mansions. So I, I would say no. That that would be a probably even more dramatic than the Sims discussion over 40 acres coming. And I agree, it should be perhaps housing, parks, commercial. We talk about commercial needing space here in town. So, and I think you look at the debate on the Cape over Twin Brook golf courses. Golf courses do go away. And if you lock this in as open space in the town's mind, rolling it back to allow some housing or anything else, I think would be a, a decision we'd come to regret. I think let's, I would say, let's save that property for the big discussion that we'll have if it ever comes free, which it probably won't, but I, we should plan for the future. So thanks. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, this time we'll close public comment on this. Um, agenda item. Um, so uh, just to discuss with the board, um, one of the, or I guess I should ask you the question, um, is your request that the board uh, take on either or both of these articles or um, 
is your request for, for support. Everybody comes in with a different request, so just looking to see what your request is here. I would love it if the board ran with both. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. So I would like to turn it back to the board. Um, it sounds like there was um, pretty significant support with um, just one s significant question um, for the for, for the Inland Wetland District. Uh, for the open space, it sounds like there are quite a lot of questions and unknowns and potential um, potential um, mapping and uh, map review that would need to occur. So I'm interested in hearing the board's feelings on taking on um, either or both of these articles. And I'll start with Ken. Uh, well, would this be for the spring or for the fall? There's no fall, just spring. Spring, this year? This year. I'm not sure we have time to do that. In, uh... which, which one? Number two? Open space? Both. I don't think we have uh, time this year to do e either one. Um, okay. Because uh, if we if we can take on this and not take on uh, uh, commercial, uh, the business districts and the heights and stuff that we did, we have also had promised people that they would look at right away, saying it's too busy, we don't have enough time to do that, and then we take on this. It's not a good thing. Uh, okay. I, I just would set priorities. And if you want us to take it on uh, this spring, I don't think we have the, uh, the bandwidth to do that. Uh, I would say if you could do it, we would support you. Uh, but otherwise, it, it would have to wait till either the fall or next year. All right. Thank you. Um, so my perspective is that I, I think that we should take on the Inland Wetland District. I think that this is well baked. Um, there's just one clarification. I think the open space still needs a lot of work, and I think we would need to discuss whether or not, to Ken's point, we think there is um, the time to to review that. It could be a mapping exercise and a simple. Um, uh, de-scoping of what is currently included in this article, but I think we would need to discuss that further. Shana? I'm in agreement with the chairwoman. Jean? Yeah, I agree. I think we can take on the inland wetland. You know, I've, I've watched this Conservation Commission for many years, and I've, I've watched them adopt better and better regulations, and, and I think they are excellent at protecting the wetland resources in town, and they've been that way for many, many years. I, I am interested to see whether there are some areas that don't quite overlap, and whether those even matter, or they're just a function of this really old zoning bylaw not doing it right. But I think we can get that, and I think we can go ahead with that. I think it seems like the appropriate thing to do and a way to get rid of yet another creaky out of date mismatch between various parts of the regulatory places in the town. Um, on the open space piece, I don't, I don't think we're gonna be ready to go. I think there were too many questions that were asked that needed to get answered um, and too many sort of decisions trees to go down to to make to doing all of these things. I think it's a worthwhile project to pursue. Um, and maybe we can designate somebody from the board um, to work with um, David and the Conservation Commission and the Open Space Commission on putting together something that would come to us 11 months from now, let's say, so that we would be able to roll into it at that point and you know maybe there'll be something separate for cemeteries or not something separate for you know some of the public spaces that are different the questions about space. the assessments et yeah and the assessments and things like that so I, I don't i don't think it's ready to go i think we can make it ready to go but it needs some time 
Great. Steve? Um, I concur. I also concur with the chair. I think uh, inland wet and the removal of the inland wetland district <laughs> is a relatively straightforward change uh, that's worth doing. You're going to make me say that five times in town meeting, too, right? <laughs> okay. Well, I, I guess I know what I'm presenting. Um, um, and and I, I agree that I, I think some of, I, I think the, like the, the goals of um, looking at revisiting some of the way some of our parcels are, are, are zoned, cemeteries, et cetera, et cetera, is worthwhile, but it's, I'm, there's, there's a lot to figure out in order to get that done. Great. Do you have any other thoughts, questions for us now that we've provided no, I think that feedback? Are great points, and I'm very glad to hear, be thoughtful about it and get some pointers about how to move forward. We'll Great. go back to the drawing board with question number two. And always happy to answer any questions or be in contact about the first issue. Great. Thank you. I appreciate all the work that has gone into both of these. I think they're really both worthwhile for us to continue pushing forward. So. Thank you, Thank you very time. much. Very really good. appreciate yeah. it. All right. Uh, that closes agenda item number two get back to my agenda and uh, we'll get that right on time. Our next uh, agenda item is uh, Zoning Board of Appeals proposed warrant articles. And I believe we have Christian Klein from the chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals here with us this evening. Thank you so much, Christian, for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. And we have not one, not two, not three, but six. <laughs> six proposed um, warrant articles, all um, very worthwhile for discussion in terms of, um, you know, uh, what I understand to be um, sections of the zoning bylaw which um, are are particularly um, meaningful and uh, to the to the ZBA, and it looks like as well from the conservation. Um, Commission uh, with related to things that you run into regularly Absolutely. in your practice. So, Christian, if you wanted to take it away, um, would you like to uh, review them as a group, or would you like to go one by one and um, entertain questions? I'm happy to go one at a time. I think Let's do that. that. I think that would probably be best. Okay. Great. Perfect. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you again for having me. Um, I'm Christian Klein, I'm the chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals, and. You know, we deal with sections of the code that the ARB often doesn't see on a regular basis in their hearings. And so uh, there's a couple things that we've identified throughout the, the past year or two that have caused us some questions, have caused us to go to council to try to get some clarification on. And so there are things that we wanted to bring to your attention uh, for possible inclusion as warrant articles uh, going forward. Uh, so the first one has to do with the question of attached and detached buildings. So the town, in the bylaws, we have a separate definition for attached and detached. Um, and attached, buildings that are attached share a common wall, and buildings that are detached have no physical connection. But there are other forms of physical connection that are not walls, that cause a, a structure, two structures to be neither attached nor detached. Um, and this has come up uh, once, and there was another case that was possibly coming forward, but. Uh, in the end, they didn't file. Um, and so I, it, it had initially come up in the question of accessory dwelling units because it, it has a question of if a dwelling unit is a, isn't attached to the main building, then um, it is approved as a part of the main building. If it's an accessory dwelling unit and it's within a certain distance of the lot line, then it requires approval uh, by the ZBA. And so there was a situation where there were two buildings, they were very close to each other, but there was a slight separation. And the question was, you know, is it attached, is it detached? How close do they have to be to be separated? Um, and in the end, we sort of had to, we found that they were, we declared them to be just not attached. Um, and because the, the particular part that they were looking at said attached and it wasn't attached, we could move forward. Um, but there are, there are situations in the parking bylaws that says attached or detached garage. So if you have a garage that's separated from the house by a breezeway, it is neither attached nor detached. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there are situations like that. So we, either we need to clarify one definition or the other so that it covers everything, or we just need to think about how we want to handle those kinds of situations so that it's, it's clear. Um, 
And the, the other part to that is uh, section 533 on the spacing of residential and other buildings on one lot. Um, it refer references the distance between a permitted main building to be used as a dwelling and a permitted non-residential building, um, which also sort of gets into this question of accessory dwelling units, is are we supposed to be considering that, on, you know, as a separate, how do we, how do we look at those in relation to 553, five, 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 uh, excuse me, 533. Three. So that was the, the first one is really the sort of question of attached versus detached and the whole in between. Okay, great, thank you. I will start with Steve on all of these CBA okay. articles. So yeah, my, I was trying to visualize the gap and the picture I came up with was uh, just sort of a walkway or uh, a ramp from yep. one to the other. I, I do agree that if we're going to define detached, uh, it should be exactly the opposite <coughs> of attached. And I, my personal thought would be to redefine detached so that it was the, the negation of attached, mm -hmm. just to make it very clear and simple. But um, if, I, if, that, if, that, if you think that would be a, a pseudo, if that would address the, the issues that the ZBA has run into. I, I think it could. Um, we'd also taken a look through where in the bylaws we use the word attached mm -hmm. and where we use the word detached. Um, we use detached a lot more um, than we do attached. Um, so we use, um, so there's a lot of places where there's exemption, there's certain street exemptions in 542 where we, certain sections of town are excluded from certain parts of the, uh, the residential restrictions and there it references attached accessory buildings um, or attached dwellings, attached dwellings. Uh, also in there, accessory dwelling units references attached dwellings um, and then location of the parking spaces talks about attached and detached garages. And then under detached, we talk about, there's a lot that talks about detached dwellings, the residential design table, the residential um, district tables are all written in terms of detached. Mm -hmm. um, so it occurs there a great amount. Uh, garages, again, the floodplain district talks about detached dwellings, uh, parking spaces talks about detached garages, and the affordable housing requirements talk about detached dwellings. So I don't know if that feeds into okay. which definition okay. makes more sense, mm -hmm. but no, that's that, sort of that's how those words are used. Anything else, Steve? Nothing else. Okay, Gene. I'm, I'm trying to consider the examples you mm -hmm. talked about. Are they mostly where there's like a, a carport and sort of an enclosed or not enclosed walkway? So what we've had sort of like an yeah. elevated deck that uh -huh. would connect an accessory, a proposed accessory dwelling unit from a main building. Uh -huh. um, and the deck makes it attached? So the deck, it maintains it as detached. Mm -hmm. um, the proponent strongly wanted it to be considered attached because it didn't meet the definition for detached. But you know, we're like, well, it doesn't meet the definition for attached anyway, mm -hmm. either. So you sort of then you're in that, in that gray zone. In the end, we did decide that it was just not attached you know, because attached was the primary word in that section. And tell me, say again, how it comes up in the situation of accessory dwelling units. So under accessory dwelling units, if an accessory dwelling unit is attached to the primary residence, right. then it is either approved or not approved as a part of the structure. If it is detached from, the, if it's not attached and it's in an, a separate accessory building, as long as it conforms to the setback requirements, then it would go through the normal process. But if it's within this, if it's within six feet of a lot line, then it's required to go before zoning. But if it's attached and within six feet, it wouldn't. But then what's the level of attachment that is required to move it from one category to the other? Is there a simple fix or is it more, these are <clears throat> factors to consider in determining whether something's attached or detached. I think it could be, there's, I think there's two ways of looking at it. One way is there are, currently there are sort of these, it sort of falls into three buckets at the moment. They are either one or the other or sort of neither. Right. And I think that we could clarify in one of the definitions, just add a line that if it is, you know, if we were to stay with attached, if it's, you know, a, a structure that does not contain a wall in common, shall be, you know, shall be detached. 
or shall be considered detached, just so that we put into one category or the other. Um, and I think we can, that would be a simple way to do it, and then the definition for detached stands on its own as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. That's it. Jane, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> so you mentioned um, you mentioned carports mm -hmm. as as a situation. I I also am trying to grapple with sure. um, with what the solution is, what the desired solution is, and I'm sort of wondering where you've been coming down on on things that are essentially mm -hmm. not a party wall. So luckily we have not had the, 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 the semi-attached garage come up, um, but that was when we were sort of brainstorming like what the issues possibly could be. It's, you know, so you sort of have the, the traditional house where you have a house and a garage and they build a breezeway in between that's open. Yep. That is detached, it's not detached because of the roof piece connecting it, but it's not attached because it doesn't share a wall. And then for there, if you strictly read the zoning bylaw, you could claim that it can't be used for parking. So, so can uh, can you contemplate? Um, is there a scenario that you can contemplate where something truly, truly does not have a party wall, but kind of looks like it should fit the attached scenario? I mean, I think sort of in that scenario, we uh, we would not speak as a ZBA, but I think you know, sort of looking at a at a typical New England style house where it's the house and the breezeway and the garage. I think most people would consider that as being attached, yep. even though it's not enclosed in between. Um, but I think we just sort of need to decide how we, you know, as a town, how we want to handle that. What the situation should be. So it might be more than one common wall. Yep. There might be some other yep. an aesthetic, An aesthetic um, from the street, for example, if it appears to be um, one structure. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, we need something that we can defend is, is, yeah. is really what we need. Well, Gee, if I can pick up please. on that, I, th I think the answer is not one or the other. I think the answer is what's the better outcome and then how do we mm -hmm. write the definition mm -hmm. for the better outcome, right? Absolutely. If it's the detached garage with a carport, is it better that that garage be considered attached to the building in terms of how we do our business in town or not? So before I think we decide which way to write this, mm -hmm. we need to hear from <coughs> the ZBA mm -hmm. What's the better option? What's the better outcome? Okay. Not give us one or the other. Yep. But which is the better outcome with the ADUs? Which is the better outcome? Okay. And then that would help us decide how to write this. So a list of the that. potential scenarios and yeah. Yeah. the better outcome. Okay. Uh, Kim. Yeah, I think uh, Jean hit it right on the head. Yeah. yeah. It's it's the outcome. Um, of what we want to do, and then we would write the regulations to that. But, but you are correct. It's basically there's three: mm -hmm. attached, not attached, and something in between. Yeah. All we want to do is clarify that thing in between. Right. And that's all we have to do. And what we want to do is we'll clarify that based on what outcome we want. I mean, I remember this being a project we looked at at uh, Sunny's. Um, Sunny Drive, Sunny Side. Right. Sunny Side Drive right. where they were going to put these, oh, that's right. these right. big mansions there and they had this one heated corridor that connected this other Sky, garage. A Skyway. Yeah. yeah, and it yeah. was and it was all one big happy building and we said no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and um, I, don't, we, I don't think we want to get that way. So that's how they said that we decide, you know, it's that breezeway that connects the building. Yeah. Okay, it, is it just a deck and a roof, deck, roof, and wall, so it's enclosed, or we go even one more step and say it's conditioned. Right. Um, so, but let's not decide all those noble gimmicks until we figure out what's the outcome we want. Absolutely. Do, do we want to increase the sort of density at the edge because there's a loophole they can go for or not? So, can you come back to us and Absolutely. say, hey, uh, <clears throat> Our recommendation is this because it does this. 
-hmm. And I think uh, we're all on board for that, something like that. At least I am. Okay. So I think um, in order to submit the Warren article, that mm -hmm. language, we can continue to work and wordsmith. I think mm -hmm. the Warren article could be written in such a way that um, we can speak to the clarification okay. without actually providing the, the Warren article. Would others agree to that? See if the town will amend the zoning bylaw of the town of Arlington to the, for the purpose of clarifying um, the definition of attached, detached, and, and detached, and addressing yes. cases that meet neither of the above. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I just wanted to talk through timing mm -hmm. for that yeah. as well. Okay. Great. So it sounds like the board is supportive of this clarification. And we will get back to you with some okay. additional information on that. Great. Um, the second one is section 5310, which allows using the average setback along a street as the front yard setback, but it only applies to vacant property. And so the question is, should where we don't have a lot of vacant property, we do have situations where we have a street where the setback is just for the street is not what the actual setback says in the zoning bylaw, but is sort of set by the houses that are there currently. Um, should there, if the property is vacant, then somebody is allowed to take that position. If the property is not vacant, then they're required to adhere to the full setback, the way it's written. And the question is just the clarification, is, is that really what we're intending in that situation, or is it better to maintain the street edge as it stands currently? So if somebody's house is a little bit farther back and they want to do a small addition on the front of their house that would bring them to that average setback. Is that allowable? Yes, please go ahead, Ken. Have you talked to Mike Chaffa about this? Um, I have not. I believe that their interpretation mm -hmm. is not quite exactly this. Okay. And I don't want to put words in his mouth, okay? Yep. But I, I think it has nothing to do with vacant or or or, or non-vacant. Mm -hmm. I think it has to do with if someone wants to encroach upon the setback and the average of the setback on that street yep. is less than they can meet that average. Right. And I think that's what they've been allowing. And I, I believe that that is likely the case, but that's not what the bylaw says. I realize that. <laughs> but we should make that clear so right. that it's either we enforce it what the bylaw says or change the bylaw to to follow what they enforce, because right. it's, I'm just seeing this and seeing what they've been doing all along is different. Mm -hmm. So if you just talk to them about that Absolutely. and see how we should proceed, mm -hmm. or what their recommendations are too. Okay. Okay. Great. Shana? Um, <clears throat> what's your interpretation on redevelopments of parcels that are currently not vacant? So, if you were to, if there was an existing building on the property and the property was being demolished and the property being wholly redeveloped, then it's a very good question because the at the time the building is demolished, the property is now vacant, but it wasn't vacant at the time. So you can't take it. You can't. I guess you. I, I would say if you are fully demolishing and rebuilding, then you would because you're required to adhere to all the requirements of the zoning bylaw, then you would be able to take advantage of that provision and build up to that line. However, if you were maintaining two walls of your property in order to claim that it is not a new development, but you are doing an addition, then that puts you into, you know, you are, you are only a lot, you are able to take advantage of certain other aspects, specifically for, um, the sections of the bylaw that deal with nonconformity that would allow you to do essentially the same thing. Well, that seems to that seems to honestly be not that not that useful <laughs> in, in my opinion. Um, um, yep. Uh, 
Uh, I would second Ken. Talk to Mike Chapla. See what see what's being done now. Gene. I there are quite a few sections of the bylaw I find very mysterious, mm -hmm. and, the, and, and this is one of them. Um, Quote you on that, Gene. <laughs> and you know, as 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 I think you're pointing out, it doesn't make any sense that if somebody is building a house on a vacant lot, they get to use a different setback than somebody who already has a house on on the lot and wants to do something with it. That, that seems crazy. I would basically, I, this is another one. What do we want the outcome to be? Right. Right? Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. This is, I, I, I guess my personal feeling of this has always been that didn't, this didn't make any sense at all. And I would just X out 5.3.10 altogether because if, town meeting in its wisdom had established a certain setback, why are we then letting people sort of change the setbacks based upon what other people did before there was zoning or when it was changed? So, you know, we can do anything we want in terms of thinking about what do we want to present to town meeting. I'd say one thing to think about is does this even make any sense at all to try to figure out which is the better way to do it? Should we allow it one way or the other? Or should we just get rid of this? I don't know the answer, but I'm just mm -hmm. putting it out there as another way to think about it. Great question. Steve? Yeah, I mean, this is one of those sections where the bylaw is not quite internally consistent with itself. Yes. Where, you know, the 5310 says, sure, if the whole street is non or if a portion of the street is non conforming, sure, you could build with the non conformity. We have another section of the bylaw that says it is in the intent of this bylaw that non conformities were applicable or were practical should not continue in perpetuity. <laughs> so you've got one side that says, yeah, let's continue it, and one side that says it, it doesn't. And make it worse. This makes it worse because it non conformities are more lots. Yeah, and I, I, I do agree that it does, you know, sort of create two different scenarios depending on whether uh, a parcel is conforming or non-conforming. Mm -hmm. um, I sort of question you know, whether someone would demo an entire building, assuming a buildable yep. lot, just to take advantage of the provision rather than you know, do, try to remodel and reuse. Right. Um, this is another section of our bylaw that I think <clears throat> may help encourage demolition rather than reuse. Um, I, it does seem wrong to, to, it does seem awkward, I'll, I'll say awkward, <laughs> um, you know, to impose, um, to have one set of standards for, um, you know, where a full demolition is taking place and another set of standards where a full de demolition is not taking place and to be, you know, sort of, to compound, compound things, there's, there are lots of unbuildable lots in Arlington um, right. by today's standards where you know you couldn't take advantage of this. You couldn't use this provision if, even if you wanted to. So I, I, I think... Do you agree with Gene? We should just take it out? After checking with Mike Champion, so he yeah. Sure yeah. anything yeah. else that, that he uses it for that would be important for us to keep it in yeah, to I, preserve. I mean, part of me thinks that let's check with, with inspectional services mm -hmm. and, um, you know, perhaps consider clarifying mm -hmm. the, their interpretation, okay. uh, similar to what we did with large additions. Right. Um, just right. so that there's not a not a question mark. It's clear. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, otherwise, I, you know, I, I don't. I'm not without expressing an opinion on which side or the one way or the other. I, I think it would be you know, more logical to impl impl uh, apply one set of standards regarding whether it was a full or a partial redevelopment. And how often is this used? That's the other question to ask Mike. Not yeah. If it doesn't happen very often, it's another reason to get rid of it. I would right. think. Are we? Um, how do we feel, or how do folks feel about um, about the front yard setbacks, um, uh, as opposed to 
uh, the written front yard setbacks as opposed to the front yard setbacks that that you see visually. You know, are are we going to start seeing houses um, infill that is set much further back? Is that going to have um, is the aesthetic going to be changing? And how do we feel about that? By not having this provision. By not having this provision. Great question. And that might be where, again, Mike Champa, you're indicating that your understanding is that might be how they're currently applying this. Yeah, but there's also exceptions to uh, existing non-conforming sites that they can use that rule or something along those lines. I, it just, it's, I don't know the whole thing, so I can't yeah. uh, speak clearly. I just know that it's fuzzy right now. Right. And I totally agree we should get rid of it and have one set of rules. But, you know, we do, you are 100% correct, we do run into the fact that if we do follow the rules of, uh, well, here's the setback, you have to follow it. Right. And and that just ruins uh, an urban edge if, on an infill, and that doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have these exceptions. Yeah. So, but we just gotta see what applies, what doesn't apply right now. It seems to be in two different spots right now. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And you, you pick out a good one, but there's another one that, that uh, you haven't mentioned yet, and I think that's what Mike follows. Yeah. Is that correct? I'm happy to sit down with him and, yeah. and figure okay. that out. All right. So it sounds like that's the path forward there. All right. Uh, number Next. three, I think you've already talked about a bit this evening. Um, so sections 5, 7, and 5, 8, which is the floodplain district and the inland wetland district. Yes. Are both parts of the zoning bylaw, but seem much better covered by the Conservation Commission. Yes, we will be zoning. supporting that um, the removal yeah. of the, in, yes, in the wetland okay. district, yes. And then the, would the floodplain district be? That we were told um, is required uh, ah. by, mm -hmm. by law to by FEMA. 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 Yes. Okay. FEMA. Oh, by FEMA, okay. Yes. All right. Very good. Um, so number four we had, uh, so section 592, which is the accessory dwelling unit section, um, it gets to a certain point and then it switches from letters and numbers to bullets. How did we let that happen? And it's just, it's, it's just awkward to cite things. So we have citations like section 592B1, bullet 5, subsection 3, which is just, you have to now count the bullets and make sure you're getting to the right one. So if, yes. if we could exchange the bullets for some other unique identifier, that would be great. Are we all in agreement? We'd love to clean that one yes. up and yes. hopefully get that one on a consent agenda. Uh -huh. Yes. Okay, yeah. great. How come you didn't pick out all the others that have bullets in it? it this is the one that we, <laughs> we deal with all the time. Gene, if there's anything you'd like to add to no, this. No, no, no. Okay. No, but certainly there are other, there are other places. <laughs> there are lots of bullets there in There are lots of places. Um, so 610, uh, 6110 <laughs> and 6111. Um, I, I think it, they need a task force at this point. Um, there are, these are the sections on residential parking that have been added onto and amended and added onto and amended. And in the end, they're sort of convoluted and difficult to follow and hard to interpret in places. Um, it's, I don't think it's an easy fix. Um, I think it would take some sitting down and really thinking through exactly what we want as a town. Um, so it may not be something for this year, but it's certainly something that think something about. Something that we should start. That we should start thinking, okay. looking forward. Because um, there, there is just a lot, there's a lot to it. We need to start thinking exactly what we want to do. Steve. So, so as um, having served on the ZDA, yep. I, can, I can verify that there have been at least a couple of dockets where the meaning of those sections was not clear at all. And even less clear was how to apply them to a given parcel. Um, it's, there's, there is a little bit of circular wording, um, mm -hmm. and I, I think in terms of just residential parking in general, um, I think clear, having something that's clear and readily understandable would be a big improvement. Um, I also think it's worth, you know, possibly revisiting residential parking, some aspects of residential parking regulations in general. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I agree that it is 
uh, a rewrite I, I think is warranted yeah and you know but it, it will take effort and it sounds like once again involving Mike Champa and ISD and how they're currently um, uh, it's worse than that <laughs> as Steve can attest while we were doing recodification this was one of those sections where we're just like we we just have to not deal with this now but we, yeah. know we have to come back to okay it. Mm -hmm. so this might be a 2025 but we'll spend some time yeah okay I, I think any other thoughts to Jean? Have, um, the transportation planner as part of the group that works on this Absolutely. Sure. Gina any thoughts on this one just that there are such strong feelings about parking generally in town I wouldn't uh, want to see cleanup without um, without a comprehensive look at parking policy mm -hmm. okay any other thoughts no I wholeheartedly agree that this needs to be looked at at a task force level just because uh, the size of the parking spaces, the drive lanes. Um, parking in front of or behind the building, the whole thing. Right? Yes, yeah. um, compact spaces, uh, electric charging state, everything that, that, that has to be sort of grouped mm -hmm. yeah. and looked at it as one, as, uh, one comprehensive thing. Uh, it, and that's going to take a while to uh, redo. I think uh, what we have is something that's based in the 70s. Uh, you know, with the, with the big, big cars, uh, <laughs> and uh, so we we just need to do that. Okay. And then the the last one I had um, is in regards to the location of accessory dwelling units um, in accessory buildings. So the way that the bylaw was written, five nine two. Um, an accessory dwelling unit that is within six feet of the side and rear lot line can be approved uh, by uh, essentially a section that six determination by the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, but accessory buildings cannot be built within six feet of the property line. And so we had sort of considered a couple different options and what we feel was most likely what was intended was that accessory dwell new accessory dwelling units could be constructed closer than six feet to the lot line so long as they had an approval and that was to be considered an exception from the standard setback that's in the dimensions table but the dimensions table doesn't list section 95 uh, 592 as an except as containing an exception it doesn't mention um, that to see section 542B for exceptions. And it may just be as simple, if the interpretation is that accessory dwelling units can be constructed de novo within six feet of the property line, that, that, that the note that's on the table just indicates that see section 542B and 592B for exceptions. Um, but if the interpretation was that no, that, that accessory dwelling units were not to be constructed newly within six feet of the property line, property line we need that to be clarified. Great, Steve. So I, I have a vague recollection that the uh, special permit permit within mm -hmm. six feet was to accommodate the conversion of an existing garage right. uh, to an accessory dwelling unit. Now garages, although there are setbacks in in five four two, there mm -hmm. are a separate set of garage setbacks in five four two B seven. Yes. Um, outside of the main dimensional tables, and. I, I, I'm wondering, was sort of wondering if it is, would be appropriate to cite that, or perhaps, and this would be messy, to move the sort of garage setbacks, which vary on type of construction, into the main dimensional tables. I think that the garage exceptions, the, the garage exceptions for new garages, I think, are, are fine as they are. Mm -hmm. um, the, the real question comes in is the is the interpretation that this section in 592 on accessory dwelling units is it intended only to apply to cases where there is an existing garage, garage. that's being mm -hmm. converted or is it more general that you can build an accessory structure that is an accessory dwelling unit as an exception to the normal mm -hmm. six foot setback that's required under the under the table okay all right thank you gene how have you been interpreting it? 
So we had the, we, we had our first real case where this came up recently, um, and it was uh, it's a case on, it was on Dorothy Road, and it was a property that was owned by the um, by HCA, and they were looking to build an accessory dwelling unit in the rear yard. Um, and we had gone back and forth. We had talked to council. Um, and the interpretation that the board took was that you could construct a new accessory dwelling unit within six feet of the line as long as you met the requirements for a, for a determination that it was not more detrimental. Mm -hmm. That's exactly the way I interpret this too. Mm -hmm. So my suggestion yep. may not be a good one, so my suggestion is leave this you have the right to do rules Let's and regulations. Mm -hmm. Put something in the ZBA rules and regulations that basically says what you just said. This is how this is interpreted. And that's all that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. Shana? That approach makes sense to me. Ken? Uh, I don't know. I think a little differently. I think the, in the intent of, uh, of, the, of the ADUs was, in this case here, was for an existing. He doesn't say that. I, I, I realize that, Gene. And I think that was missed or something along that, but I think it was the intent to, uh, to convert an existing structure to, uh, to allow it to be built closer. When it, what, if it's new, it has to follow the regulations. Mm -hmm. there's, no except, there's no exception for that. I think that was the intent because first time I, I went around uh, that's that was what it was what it was and then the second time it came back for the EUs, it was changed because that was a, a, a point that brought up and we changed that so that it would say uh, for existing structures to for it to be able to be converted not new structures uh, but that was my regulation at that time uh, working with Barbara at that time. Um, so can I add on to that? Because I actually found the fact sheet ah. that Barbara created oh. when, when we were um, presenting this article to mm -hmm. town meeting, and it talks about ADUs in, garage, in garages um, and the fact that, um, you know, they're the most complicated because you need to add water and solar and gas, electric, et cetera. Um, but they are specific to Article 43 adds an extra requirement for a garage or carriage, carriage house, meaning these existing mm -hmm. conversions that is close to the lot line. If a garage is within six feet of the lot line and is no longer eligible for an as of right ADU approval, the homeowner who wishes to proceed must present their case to the Zoning Board of Appeals. The ZBA provides a public discretionary approval process, which all the neighbors are notified and have the ability to object. Mm -hmm. So. Um, it does not in this, and again, just because this was the fact sheet doesn't right. mean that this is what you know was approved or made it into the final sure, language. Sure. Um, but that was my recollection as well, was that that specific provision was for how it's written right here. Mm -hmm. um, again, what is it that we would like to see in practice becomes the question. Um, but my recollection is similar to Kim's. Well, Steve. this to throw just a you know, to make it more complicated. Absolutely. You know, if I want, we if do. a person wanted to build a, a new garage, mm -hmm. type through construction, concrete, yep. they could put it right up against the lot line. Mm -hmm. They built the garage, they leave it there for a little while, now they want to turn it into an ADU. That would be, you know, it's a roundabout path, but yep. I, I could connect the dots. Mm -hmm. And, you know, knowing that the dots could be connected like that, I, I sort of agree with Mr. Benz <laughs> in the sense of just, you know, just don't make it crazy. Mm -hmm. And it's, it sounds like for, it sounds like from the Dorothy Road, it's a better outcome to do that and just you know, to, to sort of put it in the rules and regulations so it's clear that that's how it, you know, it's being interpreted. But again, I would just check with my champ on making yeah. sure it's same I, interpretation. I would just say my my only concern with just think, just having that interpretation in the rules and regulations is that people aren't going to look there for interpretations. They're just going to be looking to the zoning bylaws. Well, you can train them. <laughs> <laughs> or we could add a sentence that this says this applies to new as well as existing structures. Yeah. We could put that sentence in there, right? 
or if we just refer to this section as an exception to the table, mm -hmm. then that would work as well. Ken, what are your thoughts on that? I don't know. I can go either way. I think it's, it's, it's going back to the original, what's the outcome we want? Right. And then whatever we modify is what's that, that's all. And we're here to, I'm assuming here is to, to streamline the stuff and you have less confusion and so far that. So what do we want? Right. Uh, and if, if we don't want ADUs built so close to the property line, then get rid of it. If we want to leave some, leave it uh, for some hardship cases, because there's already an existing building there, then we keep it in. And. Uh, but I think the question isn't removing this; it's retaining the right for um, existing uh, existing structures to come in front of the ZBA and adding potentially adding, again, based on the mm -hmm. interpretation, new structures being constructed to also fall under this. Yeah, I would add it to their, that's yeah. their, that's in the, the In the zoning bylaws as opposed to the rules and regs. Yes, not the right. rules and regs. So what's, what's the answer to this question? They come before you and they say, mm -hmm. we're building a garage yep. on the lot, up to the lot line, with an ADU on top. So they're building it all at one time. What's right. the answer? So if there, if a portion of the accessory structure contains an accessory dwelling unit and it's within six feet, then the board has to make a determination. If it doesn't include an accessory dwelling unit and it's a garage, then it falls under the garage rule. So if it's an accessory dwelling unit and it's an accessory structure and it's neither a garage nor a dwelling unit, then you're not allowed to build it. So it's a little hall of mirrors. Hmm. It could be a storage shed. It could be a storage shed. Yes. As long as it's under 70 square feet. We yes. Should, <laughs> this, this, we should fix this. I'm not sure quite how. Okay. So I think this um, falls into the same section as, or the same as uh, 5.3.10 in that we would need to, um, it sounds like work together with the ZBA after, again, talking to my Jampa yeah. mm -hmm. a little further and um, work work through the, the, the final language, but perhaps the Warren article could identify to clarify the intent yeah. um, and then the language can be worked on up mm -hmm. until uh, the hearing. I think we have two or three. Christian needs to talk to Mike. Absolutely. When this came up a couple years ago, I volunteered to be the ARB person to sit on on that mm -hmm. and craft the change, so great. I'd be happy to do that okay. again if that would work with you. Absolutely. Great. So let's. Um, Jean willing to. I vote to nominate Jean. I don't need to nominate <laughs> with um, Mike, C, and Christian. So let's just um, clarify which we'll be moving forward with. Um, so we identified the um, the attached building and detached building. Um, and, and again, this is making sure that we're aligned on these being um, ARB articles that we're putting forth um, in uh, collaboration with the, with the ZBA. So um, the first was attached building and detached building. The second was um, this, the uh, changing uh, the bullets to letters. Um, uh, changing the um, uh, average setback along the street uh, related to vacant land, uh, the exception related to vacant property. Um, we've already talked about the inland wetland and floodplain district, so that we will not, for this particular item, move forward with, but we're moving forward separately. The CONCOM, um, let's see, we indicated that we would Defer to 2025 section 6.1.10a and 6.1.11a, and we will move forward. The last item with regard to the clarification regarding um, ADUs and accessory buildings within six feet of the uh, within the six foot set setback. 
we need al in alignment? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, great. Uh, any members of the public who have any comments uh, they would like to make on any of the zoning bylaw articles put forth by the ZBA? Okay, we'll close public comment on that one. And we'll thank you very much, Christian. Thank you so much. I appreciate the time. I really appreciate yes, it, Christian. Thank you. thank you for bringing thank all you. of these forward. Mm -hmm. And you know where to find me. I will find you. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, so that closes agenda item number three. Um, and we'll now move to agenda item number four, which is a proposed um, parking lot plan um, from Green Street to Arlington. Is there a representative who would like to come forward? Fantastic. Thank you very much. So if you could introduce yourself um, for the record and then uh, share your thoughts on um, the uh, proposed plan that you'd like to discuss this evening. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Susan Stamps. And, and I'm sorry, I'm just going to remind you one more time, if you wouldn't mind projecting as much as you can oh. for the folks that are, oh, right, that are behind as well. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you. My name is Susan Stamps. I am with the group Green Streets Arlington and also a member of the Tree Committee and a town meeting member, 39 Grafton Street. And with me is Alan Jones. Alan Jones, Precinct 14, member of Green Streets Arlington. Great. So you. we did um, up on the screen is the proposal. Um, the the background of the proposal. This was one of the a part of our six point plan that we presented at the time that we were discussing MBTA communities zoning, and uh, we agreed with the planning department that this was a change that needed to be made to the underlying zoning. So that's why we're back here now with this proposal and hoping that the ARB will support it and, and, and help us write it because it's pretty detailed. The idea is to require shading in parking lots. And this is something that I think was not thought about when the parking lot regulations in the zoning bylaw were written because I don't think the writers were particularly concerned about the heat island effect of the pavement absorbing the sun and making everything around it hot and in fact making the whole town hotter than it needs to be. But now with climate change and everything and uh, the weather getting hotter and hotter every year, we just had the last two couple of years, the hottest ones on the planet, we need to be, Green Streets Arlington hopes to help the town adopt uh, initiatives which can hurry up and help protect the town from heat and also in other effects of time, uh, climate change such as stormwater mitigation. It uh, just happened today we had these this really really heavy rains that we didn't used to have these rains and now they're fairly common and so the stormwater and heat are the main reasons why we are proposing that we put in new rules for our parking lots requiring uh, trees to be planted in the parking lots and also uh, uh, both for shade and stormwater mitigation and we've been asked about solar panels can those be used for shade and the answer is yes that's fine with us as long as there are uh, trees a lot around the perimeter so that there would be some trees, but um, there are two things that trees do. Two, well, trees do a lot of things. They clean the air, um, they respirate oxygen um, and moisture, and certainly they absorb carbon. So those are very important climate change jobs that they do, but also their roots, of course, absorb stormwater. So that's also really important. The only things that they also do that is shared with solar panels is they create shade. So that would have to be a call really by the planning department, whether you want to give up all the benefits of trees for solar panels if it seems like we really need to be doing a lot more with solar panels to get help get off of fossil fuels. So that's kind of a question that's up in the air. But we have presented a um, 
a two-pager which summarizes a proposed uh, uh, bylaw change um, that is based on, um, tells you what the elements are based on one that we found in Greenberg, New York, uh, which is a smaller, smaller place than Arlington, but um, they, and it actually hasn't been adopted in Greenberg, but they, it, it, but that was for unrelated reasons, but they still are following it. We've uh, looked around the state and there are a few municipalities around the state that require trees in parking lots, say every 12 spaces or 10 spaces, but they're not really focused on shade. They could be ornamental trees. I'm not exactly sure why they're they're required in the, in the parking lots. For example, West Springfield requires um, trees in parking lots, but we have found other places around the country, a few other places, that talk about trees in the parking lot in terms of percentage of shade that they provide. And that's what we think is, that's, that's, the, that's the important approach. And so we're suggesting 50% um, shade cover within 15 years of planting. So um, what we found around the country is in, in uh, LA actually has um, a 50% tree canopy in 10 years, 50% uh, shade of tree canopy in 10 years in their parking lots. Um, also Sacramento has a similar ordinance, which um, after 15 years, 50% um, canopy coverage in their parking lots. We also found one other place, and I'm sure there are places we missed. It, it's not that common yet, though. And so once again, Arlington can be an environmental leader, and that's what we're looking for. Um, and we, in South Elgin, Illinois, and they have a population of about half of ours with um, considerably more land. Uh, but they, theirs is 40% tree canopy coverage in 10 years. And we would like to see this apply to any parking lot. Um, Gene Benson and David uh, Morgan were both uh, very kind to go over our proposed our proposal. And uh, there were questions about, well, if, you know, what what's the minimum size parking lot? Would it apply? A couple of these places exclude single family and two family homes. Um, one place, I think it's Sacramento, says it applies to any any place that has a parking lot. You don't have a parking lot when you have a two-family home, or even a three-family home, probably. So those would be details to be worked out. I'd like to so. add that when we were doing our research and trying to figure out where in the zoning bylaw this would fit, sort of searching stuff, we actually found it. It's Great. Uh, 6.1.11 F2 bullet one or bullet two subsection bullet one <laughs> or whatever uh, it says we already do this in an industrial zone with pervious pavement as an alternative it says 50 percent shading or photovoltaic so one simplistic way of looking at it is just make applicability broader than just that one condition <clears throat> the specification there may not be uh, enough detail it, it, it's just like one one sentence that says that but at least there is precedent in the zoning bylaw to do this all right. Uh, should I turn it over to the board unless you have yes, anything else? Please, yes, Okay, please. great. Um, Steve, why don't you kick us off sure. on your thoughts on this one? Um, yeah, so uh, one, and this is primarily for the board, uh, one of the allowed uses, uh, one of the uh, uses regulated by our zoning bylaw is a ground-mounted solar photovoltaic, so a ground-mounted solar photovoltaic installation. It's also a defined term. But we only allow this in the in the industrial districts, mm -hmm. and um, you know, as as part of 
considering this, um, maybe we want to broaden the set of districts where that use is allowed. Um, in terms of how large of a parking lot, I mean, one precedent is, you know, the places where we do, our, by, our zoning bylaw does apply a greater degree of regulations to a parking lot, it starts at six spaces. Mm -hmm. So there's basically one set of rules for five and fewer, and one set of uh, six or more. Um, there's precedent there. I mean, that this too can be revisited. I guess I was wondering, I, I have two basic questions. So the first is, why 50%? And number two, just hypothetically, say, uh, as a board member, I'm given a planting plan. How do I evaluate whether or not that meets 50%? And that question was inspired by you know, the sample drawing. Yes. Um, yes. But I'll, if you could, if, uh, you wouldn't mind answering. So why 50% well, and then how, how given, given this plan, how, how do I derive those numbers? So I think that, I mean, I would be very happy if it required 100% coverage. It just seems like that would be, an, maybe there wouldn't really be many, you know, room for many cars in the parking lot, and then you're questioning why you even do in the parking lot. So we just followed the example of these other places that have these mm -hmm. uh, requirements in place, which appear to be working. Okay. Um, yeah, and, and I think, as Susan said, 50% just seems to be the common language okay. around the country, and it's what's in our bylaw for mm -hmm. that All right. particular exception. Yeah. And, 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 and to be honest, this discussion all started in relation to the MPTA Communities Act. Mm -hmm. yeah. How many new parking lots are going to be built in Arlington? Well, if we start making larger buildings within the overlay districts, that's probably where there are going to be new parking lots. So whatever the size or distinction is to define it, we want to make sure it applies to new multifamily, you know, denser housing in the MBTA districts, but for anywhere else in town. But I think that's where we're going to see new parking lots. And the other question was? Uh, so given a planting plan, how, how, what, what's the process? Walk me through the steps to, to determine, um, you know, if I got a planting plan like this without the numbers, how would I determine, how would I, how would I come up with the numbers? I think it's going to be an inexact science, and what we found is that certain trees with a different density have a different score. It's 100% or 80% or 75%, and then you draw something like that. The sun moves, and there's buildings casting shadows, and there's what season you're talking about. So it's not going to be exact. But I think what you end up doing is taking a certain density of specific species of trees, which typically have a, a, a branching radius and have a typical density, but it's mm -hmm. not going to be an exact science. I think that's where the tree warden and you know planning board comes in. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, again, it doesn't seem to be addressed in too much detail in the regulations mm -hmm. we looked at. So I think we'd have to make some assumptions and you know do our best with certain species at a certain distance apart will provide that that shading so without being too specific about it. The the Greenberg, New York. Uh, uh, bylaw ordinance has an, a tree list apparently it's not in the document so I haven't actually seen it but apparently a tree list uh, created uh, approved by the tree warden or someone in the planning department who's responsible for trees the, the guy I talked to there was is in the planning department he's the assistant director he's also an, a, um, a certified arborist they have a list of native species and what their expected canopy coverage canopy would be at 15 years or whatever the, the uh, requirement was there. And we have precedent in town now of having to provide a tree plan by developers for approval by the tree warden to show what trees are on a property and what they want to take out, what they're going to leave, how they're going to protect them, and all these other things. So, and the, which the tree warden is very used to working with. And so, it's the same concept in building a parking lot: is that you're you, you're you're showing what trees you're adding mm -hmm. versus what trees you're taking okay. out. But it's it's that, that, that something that yeah. 
Nothing further, Madam Chair. Okay, great. Thank you. Jean? Yeah, thanks for bringing this forward. Some of the questions I'm going to ask are the same questions I asked when we talked. Yeah. Um, so one of the um, statements, let me call this up on my screen here. One of the statements is that this applies to a reconstructed parking lot. I'm not sure what makes a parking lot reconstructed. What does that mean? That's a good question. I had a little conversation with Mike Champo about that. Okay. And yeah, again, it's a fuzzy line, but basically it means you bring in heavy equipment, you peel off the parking lot, and you repave it. So basically repaving, so we might yeah. want to think about Yeah, I mean, you know, about yeah, that. Uh, you know top ceiling isn't a reconstruction, but ripping it down on the stones and repaving, that would have to be a deeper. Yeah, I think we would need to yeah. figure out how to yeah. say that. Um, we talked to the tree warden and gotten his input on this. Uh, yes, he is actually quite enthusiastic about it, as I Great. recall. We just Great. had a very committee meeting last week. Terrific. Because, yeah. I mean, you know, we just had a big failure at COP28, and um, every little bit is going to help. And I think this is um, every little bit. One of the things that I mentioned to Susan when she and I spoke was the possibility that these are contaminated grounds or even that the parking lot surface is the cap mm -hmm. on the contamination. So I think we would especially want to have something in here that says if that's the case, obviously they can't plant trees there, they'd have to use canopies to meet the requirement or get some sort of waiver if there's not adequate sun. But the same problem with planting trees around the perimeter is they may not be able to do it if they're going into contaminated soil or the trees may be shading in 15 years or whatever, the solar panels. So I think we would have to think through what are going to be the exceptions. And I think that's a problem that's already sort of been solved for other excavations, whether it's a street lamp or a well, uh, perimeter tree or whatever. It, it would be, yeah, I, it, we would have to figure out yep. what to do about this because there are clearly places where you can't plant trees because of the underground contamination, especially if there's an activity well, in use limitation. Well, trees grow, they can actually help mitigate. No, 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 not if there's an activity in use limitation there. You clearly could not do it. Um, I, I, we, we issued a special permit to um, a project a year or two ago that had six spaces behind the building. Mm -hmm. And we wouldn't have been able to have six spaces if this were there. I don't know how many spaces we would have had, but we would have probably lost at least two out of the six spaces to, to do that. I just say that because there aren't many big parking lots in Arlington, and in many cases, people try to shoehorn spaces in to get the required minimum number of spaces, even after we give them some relief um, from the number of spaces. So it would be helpful to get an idea of how many fewer parking spaces when you do this. You know, like what's the ratio of tree area to parking spaces so that we have some idea about how this would work. Um, I think that would be really helpful on this. It, it talks about um, if, if, since you spoke to Mr. Champa about this, if somebody digs up their parking lot and puts in new pavement, does he have to give them a building permit or an occupancy permit or any sort of permit? There, for um, one of the parking cases that yeah. I referred to when speaking with Mr. Klein earlier was basically uh, rebuilding a parking lot, and that did require a building permit. And it, it does. Was, okay. Yeah. Okay. I just wondered, and and this is something to talk to to Mike about too, because this in some places says building permits will not be applications will not be processed until these things happen. And another place it says they can't issue a final certificate of occupancy or completion until some of these things happen. Well, 
if if this is in the zoning bylaw, then we don't need some of that. But I question whether otherwise they this is the right language. And I know a couple of years ago we had the AG's office throw out one of our bylaws, zoning bylaws, when it said you can't issue a building permit until this happens. And the AG's office said that's not the way it works. So I think we need to have a conversation with my Champa to understand if this is consistent with what his responsibilities are. Because he's got the responsibilities to implement the zoning bylaw, but he also has responsibilities to implement the building code. And I'm not clear like when when there's tension between the two, how those work. That so was specifically we, that was put into the, it was a I reference know, to the town bylaws. I know, but okay. I, but I still think I would wanna be comfortable sure, Mike. comfortable that Mike thinks that he would not have any problem if um, this is the wording. Um, and the same thing with stormwater. When you're talking about stormwater, you're just talking about the fact that the areas with the trees will have rain going in them. You're talking about any other stormwater management other than that? Um, well, I, the thought and what, what we've seen are these wonderful um, the municipalities taking the opportunity to create rain gardens. Right. To, right. So you, you have these, think of a parking lot and you think about a lane, the trees, you know, they, you've got a bunch of parking spaces and then you have a, 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 a the word is escaping me, but a, a lane of concrete where um, the trees are. And oh, then parking spaces swell. on the other side and then. The median. A, a, a median type, of, yeah. So that that would be, um, planted with trees right. and in in amongst the trees would be grasses and other kinds of yeah just sort of big rain gardens so you wouldn't have just big squares for the trees what you'd expect it would be a whole engineering for stormwater management All right, so and probably around the periphery too and possibly including um, Sloping the pavement sufficiently that it would that the water would go into grates on the sides of the the curbs where the um, where the trees are so that the the water can be channeled into the roots. Yeah, I mean the town now has a stormwater management plan that well, new their development has to comply with. So yeah, yeah. yeah. okay, yeah. those are my and, and think, you know, yeah. part of the successful implementation has to do with irrigating the trees, watering the trees. Right. So. You know, water with stormwater right? So yeah, so so I would want to make sure that Mike thinks he can do this, that it makes sense in terms of his responsibilities. I, I would be interested in in some idea about how many fewer parking spaces we would have as a result of this to see if it's even doable with some of the small lots which may lead us to a minimum size before this goes in to affect, I think we would need some exemptions for um, contaminated properties where you can't go in to the ground because you'd be violating um, the state law and regulations on that. And um, same for the shading of the trees and some something if you can't put solar because it's a shady area, something like that. But I think if we can resolve all of those, it probably makes sense, at least to me at this point. Shana? Um, I, think, uh, I think the goal is very valuable. I think there are a few um, uh, implementation questions I have um, uh, about, for example, uh, location of trees and the ability to get trees to a healthy mature size um, you know is is there room for a root ball of a healthy mature tree in uh, the median of a parking lot uh, without losing uh, so many parking spaces that it becomes financially infeasible um, uh, is there uh, Let's see, and and the same is there room for a healthy root ball, you know, near a building. Um, going 
goal here is, of course, um, get the shade, but get healthy trees, right? Um, right. And I, I, I think it's um, e exactly the right goal to get as many trees as possible, but, but trees that are going to survive. Um, you know, West Springfield a little bit, and those, and those, uh, one tree per twelve spaces don't survive past about three or four years. Um, Can I just respond to that? What the, so they're, they're developing all kinds of ways to plant urban trees now that, mm -hmm. that um, aims their roots downward, sure. way below the parking lot, and then they can spread out to avoid the, those problems. Great. I'd be yeah. very interested in seeing more about that. I, I um, think that's part of what they're doing in Lexington Center, yeah. they've done. Yeah. Okay. Um, with the solar, uh, with with the solar, I had um, some concerns about financial feasibility, and I think um, I think I don't know. There was an article in the Globe today the that um, that flagged some issues with with implementing solar in Massachusetts right now. Um, I do think having the having the opportunity to go um, either solar or trees or a mix thereof is, is um, a good option. Um, but again, financial feasibility is something that I'd like to see some more information about. Um, so I think Jean covered a lot of my questions, um, apart from size and location of trees that could achieve the canopy uh, without undue burden on the parking lot. Thank you. Um, I'm concerned that this is an excellent proposal for a town that is not Arlington, <laughs> specifically because of the size of our parking lots. Um, I'm very concerned, you know, I don't know that we've ever reviewed, while well, I've been on the board, reviewed a parking lot that is large enough to have a median um, within it. We typically review parking lots of spaces that are between four and seven spaces, and it is a fight to get those spots in in and of itself. Um, and I think that as a board, we take great pains to ensure that there are significant shade trees. I would love you know, to be able to do more with education from the from the tree warden and, you know, working with Green Streets Arlington to make sure that we are ensuring that the um, applicants include the best species for the buffer areas where we typically have them plant trees. Um, but I think that requiring um, a significant, um, a significant dis, um, discontinuity to these already small parking areas becomes um, an you know an, an added burden to the developers um, for quite frankly what would be a very modest um, gain um, so I think that rather than adding a section to the bylaw what I'd love to do is um, to work together so that when we do in the rare occasion you know and hopefully we will have some larger projects come in front of us where we do have some of those larger um, lots come in front, in front of us I have found that de the developers have been very willing to work with us on planting plans and on configurations of parking lots with within reason and we can push them pretty far um, and when we have some of these parking lots developed, if we have some of these solutions at the, at the ready, um, I think it would be an excellent opportunity for us to consult um, and, and make sure that we have the appropriate, um, that we work together with them for the appropriate solution. I'm not sure that bringing to town meeting a Warren article and updating our bylaws for something that um, I think would have a very limited um, application 
and um, <clears throat> quite frankly might be a challenge for um, some of the, again, very modest developments that we do see, um, I think it would be a challenge. And I'm, I'm concerned a bit too, again, because of the fact that we have these small lots, they, they're asked to do a lot. So in a lot of cases, um, they are where the refuse trucks also come through, which have a much higher clearance, obviously, than passenger cars. Um, you know, they might be for, for loading, for space, they might be the moving vans are, are required to come for some of our mixed-use properties. Um, and, you know, the last thing I'd want to do is to require these beautiful shade trees. And then, you know, I know what happens on my street when <laughs> those trucks come through and they yeah, not, because. exactly. So um, I, 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 I'm, I'm supportive of the intent and I'd love to find a way to work together so that when we have an opportunity for a larger lot like you've started to depict, we're able to um, make the appropriate requirements. But personally, I, I'm, I'm not sure that there's a, a need given the, our, our typical parking lot sizes in the zoning bylaw. May, may I? Please, well, let, let me, let, let's have Ken sure. and, then, and then we can um, take any questions. I'm in 100% agreement with you, uh, Rachel. I think we all agree with the increased tree canopy. We do want that. I think the way about going about it by putting a uh, requirement on uh, parking lots is not the way to go. Um, I think it puts too much of a burden on projects that we have in Arlington. I'm not saying it may not work elsewhere, but in Arlington we just don't have that kind of space. And by doing this, it's going to um, hinder any more uh, projects that, uh, that would happen, businesses and everything else. Um, you're not clear, is this all parking? So if there was parking that's underneath the building, does that count as the parking lot too? Then you still have no. to, so, so it's parking to the op uh, yes. open parking? Yes. Okay. That happens so rare. In what we do right now, especially the way you, in, in the numbers you show it, um, the one we, uh, the Gene talked about, we had six spaces. They went down to five or four. That was built on blasted ledge. There was no way they could uh, they could put a tree there. It's right in the edge of Mass Ave where you come in from Lexington on the right hand side by the uh, pizzeria place. That's not even the one I was thinking You're of. Thinking but that's Broadway. another good example. Oh. Right. That's what I thought. That's two good examples. Okay, well, then I'm not sure what you were thinking about. Okay, <laughs> Broadway. Yeah. The mixed use property. On Broadway. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> All right, but it just—I just don't think this is very appropriate uh, for what you're trying to achieve. Okay, it's a commendable goal. I—I—I've I, talked to you before in the past about this, about tree canopies, and I think a better way to go about getting better tree canopies is working with the town and, and investing that part in in the streets where there there are plenty of uh, uh, empty uh, empty streets where we could put more trees and, and planting islands in the streets where there's parking right now uh, I, I mean I, I highly encourage that to happen and and then you put storm interceptors there to capture some of the storm water it runs back in you know, okay when you do irrigation to trees it, it, in, on projects, it's against um, leads. Leads don't want you to irrigate your landscape. So you can't have one or the other. You know, we say we want you to be lead gold or whatever, and then you're taking away some of their credits uh, by irrigating vegetation. They, they, they just want natural uh, trees that can survive on their own, no irrigation. Well, by irrigating, you mean having grapes in the storm waters is channeled over to the then, tree that's, that's not involving any pumps. Then that's right. something that has to be more clear yeah. written, okay? And uh, another thing you have to look at, if you want to get into those kind of details, mm -hmm. okay? When you talk about they're doing trees that want to go down mm -hmm. further, how they do that is by integrating air, okay? So they put these uh, PVC tubes along the sides of uh, the tree balls and introduce air down lower so 
uh, the, tr the tree roots can grab air and, and grow lower because that's how the trees get their roots. They grab air from, uh, from above. And if it's all concrete paved and everything else, they have no way of getting air. That's how you sort of strangle the tree a little bit. So talk about that. You know, we get a little more detail if you want to get into that type of uh, thing. But right now, I just don't see this being very appropriate. And I'm, I'm not, I'm, you know, I want to say I, 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 I like this, but I just can't see this being appropriate for parking lots for new projects. It just puts too much of a burden on projects, and we don't have those spaces for this to happen. And that's all. Okay. I have a I have a slightly different take on it. Um, I think you, Alan, might have mentioned this. There is a requirement in the zoning bylaw: parking areas providing more than 25 spaces shall include landscaped areas in at least 8 percent of the total paved portion of the parking area, and then it goes in from there. I think we could build into this some of the requirement for trees, um, provided that it's, that again, that we're not talking about contaminated land where they would be piercing in into the barrier. I don't think it's going to happen very often because there aren't going to be very many places where there are parking lots of more than 25 spaces coming up. But I think if we get to that number, we can just take this and just add a couple of things about trees Gene, to it. Gene, that's specifically in the industrial. No. It's my understanding. That's. I don't think so, but we have to look at that. I don't think I, so. The one I said was 6111 F2, a couple of public No, this is that different. Was specifically this, this, yeah, this is different. No, this is in the general general parking requirements um, so we sh I, I would suggest we take a look at this and see if it's somewhere we can add a trees requirement in the parking lot or in the project because I believe what you're quoting is in the project no 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 it says it has to be in the parking lot yes parking areas providing more than 25 spaces shall include landscaped areas in at least 8% of the total paved portion of the parking area. Minimum required landscape setbacks and buffers at the perimeter of the parking area shall not be counted toward the landscaping requirement. Individual strips of landscaping shall be at least four feet wide, which I think is specific, large enough for trees. So this is in... So me, it says trees or landscaping? No, it's I'm it's suggesting it's we can add a trees requirement to it. And I guess my, my is question that? is, it's 6.1.11D6. Is, is no, I, so. I think it's necessary because it will give us a hook into it because right now somebody can say, no, this is the minimum. I'm not going to put trees in it. And we don't give them a special part. I mean, we've, I, I they've don't been know. very, I would, the I, I would say that the developers have been very accommodating. The, 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 Landscaping plan is the first thing they're willing to budge on. It's true. Quite that, honestly. It is, the, it is. So my question is, is this a solution in search of a problem? Well, I mean, every single time we've asked for a tree or a bush or anything like that, I've never heard someone said no. Because it's an inexpensive solution that, right. that buys creates them goodwill. goodwill. Right. And um, yeah. I just don't want to put regulations in a such a way where it seems ominous. So when someone to come here to do this project, said, wow, look at these pages of stuff that we have to follow. And what if I mess something up? I'm going to have to go back again and do this. It's just, uh, you know, I think one of the goals that we, we're trying to do with the recodification and everything else is just trying to make things simpler, to make it easier for someone to do things. And I do, I, I mean, I agree that tree canopies are, is important, but not in this case for this parking lot. That's the only thing I'm saying. And okay. I was supporting- As part of the regulation. Yes, I, I, support, I would support elsewhere and other things. That's, that's not what I'm trying to say here. I'm just saying, in the parking lots, in this thing, I think it's too much of a poison pill for a, for a developer, that's all. Steve, Steve. We'll, we'll agree to disagree for the moment. We always do. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's, um, you know, I, I take the points that you and um, Mr. Lawick made, and I, I do agree that public space is, you know, as a municipality, that's what we have the most control over. Okay. 
Um, yes, I, I do want to wrap up yeah, our yeah, discussion yeah, pretty soon. Three, 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 sure. Three quick points. Sure. One, I, I guess I'm anticipating with MBTA communities overlay districts, we're going to get larger structures with bigger parking lots, more than we have in the past. And we'll see how that happens. Two, green, people love green parking lot. When you pull, pull into a parking lot in the summer, you look for a tree to park under. But the third thing, you mentioned half an hour ago that you may be pulling apart 6111 because mm -hmm. it's a mess. And I'm wondering if this could just be integrated into, sure. into that rather than trying to patch it into something that's already a mess. So maybe that would be an approach to take. No. I think that's fair. Yeah. Um, and if I can just add that, um, yes, it's true. These places we're looking at around the country have, they have lots of big parking lots and lots of space for big parking lots. Um, but we do have some places in Arlington that people chronically complain about because they're so hot that they make walking Mass Ave really unbearable in the summertime. And those areas, for example, <clears throat> are across the street from the high school, down at west, um, where those two banks are, it's just it feels like miles of, of black pavement there. I think I though that that's it, per Kim's comment, we need to work on municipal street trees. Yes. That well, that's, that's yeah. well, the that, thing, we're gonna have to agree to disagree on that one. Well, the thing about heat islands is that they heat the air and it goes I, I understand, not, we need to move on from that though. Okay. okay. Um, uh, before we close this, is there anyone else um, from the public who would like to speak on this particular article? Okay. Thank you. Um, so I think just to, to, to wrap this up, um, um, it sounds like there is not, again, I don't, I want to come back to the board that um, I don't, Ken and I don't support, you know, this article um, in its current form. Right. Um, it sounds like there is some support from the redevelopment board. So, for you know, a strip down. for a stripped down version of this, you know, obviously if this is an article that you would like to move forward, it wouldn't come under um, from the redevelopment board, but if it is something that you would like to move forward with, we'd be happy to, to meet with you if, again if you if you yes. do decide yes. to move we forward with it. We would like to work with you. Okay. Yeah. Um, and if you decide not to move forward with it for 2024 town meeting, and I think you made an excellent suggestion about perhaps um, incorporating some of the um, elements of this as we start looking at um, residential that was specific to residential parking but if it's you know larger in terms of parking in general that that, that might be an excellent vehicle um, for for moving some of these concepts forward as well okay so well, shall we be in touch with, with the planning director about maybe next steps uh i think that we had identified that the uh transportation yeah. planner would be um probably the person from the department who would be um, involved leading in the, involved in that effort moving forward parking task force or however it is set up yeah. exactly so i think that would probably be the appropriate person to follow up with. Right. great we appreciate your time thank you, thank you so much thank you all right um that closes agenda item um number four and we'll now move to agenda item number five permanent projects and i will turn this over to claire ricker great thank you so the board asked um that uh I take a look at the staff take a look at um, two specific uh, permitted projects at 882 Mass Ave and uh, 455 Mass Ave. And um, interestingly, uh, kind of right at the same time um, that the board made this request, 882 Mass Ave was seeking um, its occupancy permit. And so I was able to speak real, um, uh, frequently last week with the developer of the project about um, uh, deviations from permitted plans. And so what you have, what you see on the screen right now is ultimately what was um, permitted um, by the ARB. Um, and then what I have also is a picture that was taken of the project this evening. I think, you know, the, some of the things that immediately stick out to me are the white accents, um, which were not um, included in the original design, um, as well as um, the vent penetrations on the mass ave side. Um, and um, I think there was a question about the articulation and whether or not um, the art articulation had been done um, to, to the plan, um, meaning um, where, where this building sort of um, uh, comes out towards mass ave and, and, and pushes in from mass ave. Um, it's possible that that was not 
um, designed um, and built uh, deep enough. I think in my conversations with the developer this week, there was an agreement that um, whatever mitigation this board decides is um, necessary um, will be uh, fulfilled uh, by the developer um, you know, as part of the awarding of the occupancy permit, which was done Friday at 3 p.m. Um, the architect for the project was um, invited to this meeting tonight um, and I don't believe is here. Um, and so that is, I, I, I believe, um, something that I certainly will follow up uh, with the developer tomorrow um, about that. Um, but this is an opportunity for the board to sort of weigh in, at least on this project, um, and any, um, you know, any outstanding issues or, or other mitigation items um, you may want to consider or have me bring up to the developer. Great. Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, we will start with Ken. Uh, I think we have covered everything that um, things I had concerns about. I think uh, if we go ahead and uh, all the PVC white trim should be painted to match what they presented to us. Uh, you know, around the windows to match some of the dark areas, uh, around some blue areas. It, it should just blend back in. And then they have these little ticks along the front there. I'm not sure exactly what that is. The vent penetrations. Uh, but yeah. even those, yes. And then all the uh, dryer vents and uh, kitchen exhaust uh, vents should be uh, painted out to match where it's penetrating. Uh, it's, a, it's a simple um, paint job and uh, unfortunately it's going to have to be done in the spring because um, it's too cold to paint. It will, they can paint it, but it just won't stay. Right. And so it's something we're going to have to hold over their head until the spring. Uh, but we do have some, uh, I want to say, is, do they have any, uh, res any uh, tenants? tenants for the two? As far as I know, uh, part of the concern over the occupancy permit was the expectation that tenants would be moving in this weekend. Um, I did have a conversation with Mike Champa earlier today, and he said it was still possible to pull the occupancy permit if that is what the board desires. They have business tenants moving in? No. No. Yeah, I think that was your question. Mm -hmm. about the yeah. No no business tenants moving in as far as I know. I just wanted to say that they have to come back to us about signage and any canopies or anything to have. Okay. It, it, I, I want to stress very importantly to them that that, uh, that the trust has been eroded. <laughs> okay. Uh, so if we can just, you know, say it's important that, you know, that they get that right there going and then paint out the other stuff, we should be in compliance for me, as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. So I'm, I'm very disappointed in the way that this was executed. Um, the color scheme um, was not what was approved. I'm certainly not going to, um, to Ken's point, ask them to um, go back and um, uh, rework the entire color scheme of the building. However, the white accents are absolutely atrocious, and I have no idea why or when those were introduced. Um, I kept waiting for them to be painted, <laughs> and they never did get there. Um, so um, I agree, I'd like to see a rendering showing exactly how they will be painted and which colors they will be matching because again to Ken's point around trust and taste I would I would like to see what they are going to do before we agree that that is what um, we will uh, again because it differs so substantially from what was approved we need to see the plan for what they are going to do and I say we need to see that by our next meeting understood um, so that is January 8th yes. um, I also want to see all of those vents removed none of those were approved um, not just painted, removed. They need to be interior. That is going to disrupt their tenants, but that is not this board's problem. They should have that should have been included um, within their um, initial building permit package. My understanding is that those were not shown on the plans that the building inspector improved, approved either, um, and they are um, they are an absolute eyesore, and we would never have approved those as as they are on the corner and the Mass Ave facade and uh, I don't see if those return up the side street or not, but if they are, those need to be removed there as well. <clears throat> Jada. Um, <clears throat> are you aware, Claire, is it uh, 
certificate of occupancy or is it a TCO? It, I think it's the certificate of occupancy. I don't think it's a TCO. It's a full CO. It's yeah. a full CO. Yeah, okay. but it's a special permit. We still have jurisdiction over the Correct. over the project for a perpetuity or right, perpetuity. Yeah. yeah, it does make it more challenging, but um, okay. I mean, right again, we have the opportunity to right. pull the special permit at any point for non-compliance. Okay. Gene? So one thing that I I agree with all those things except the color of the building was not what we approved and I don't know if there's anything that can be done with that at this point but I think it's worth thinking about. Um, I'm also concerned about the affordable units. Can you talk about the status of that? Sure. So the uh, lottery for the affordable units was run um, erroneously initially um, and had to be rerun. And uh, not only that, what they discovered was that the location of the affordable units or the, or the units that were uh, identified as affordable um, were stacked on one side and were less than 700 square feet. And 700 square feet is the minimum size allowable by EOHLC. Um, we were, uh, we. Uh, the developer, is, for it's my understanding, was granted a waiver for unit size and location. Um, then the lottery was uh, rerun appropriately. Um, I can certainly give you an update on that, but this is my understanding at this time. Okay, so um, are, I, I looked at the plans and I didn't see anything, and maybe I missed them, that talked about the size of the units. Are there 700 square foot units or are they all smaller? I think there are seven. I think there are larger units in the building. Yeah. So, so our um, first special or special condition is that the affordable units shall be equitably be equitably dispersed throughout the building, comparable to marker rate units in terms of location, quality, character, room size, number of rooms, number of bedrooms. So, even if they get a waiver from the state, that's not a waiver from us. Mm. And they can't do what you just said they seem to be doing. Understood. Right? So I think that's another issue to bring up to them. And the same with where they are in the building and comparable size. So um, we need to have some conversation, in my opinion, with them about that too. And the same thing about making sure they meet the minimum square foot size. So um, I think those are important also. And it says that um, the affordable units had to be approved by the Department of Planning and Community Development. So if they haven't been approved by the department, we should still say no, no matter what waiver they got from, from, the EOHLC. from yeah, EOHLC, and, and let's have a discussion with them about how they're going to meet the requirements. At least that's my opinion about that. So that's what I would add to what um, has been said so far. I think it's a fair comment, yes. Steve? Um, I think you've all covered it, nothing further. Can I add one more thing? Yes, of course. Um, can we ask them to come in to our next meeting? I don't want to seem like we're coming down on you. It's not your fault. It's not <laughs> we can reopen the you. special permit. And I would like for them to come in, yes. explain, have them explain what happened, listen to what they have to say, and then we can explain to them our frustrations with them, sure. not our frustrations for you. Absolutely it's understood. nothing to do with you. Yeah. Okay, and I want to make it perfectly clear. Uh, so, if that's that, that okay, Claire? I mean, uh, Rachel? Well, I guess uh, that's a question I'd like to uh, posed to the board so I would like to request that they come in front of us with a plan with renderings again for how they will comply with the items we just identified I'm also taking a look at the um, the um, color of the uh, storefront framing for the for the storefront windows which is not correct either we had approved a dark bronze and they have a um, looks like a chrome and anodized aluminum um, storefront system and uh, entry package. Um, and I 
not excited about the uh, anodized aluminum storefront system in that particular um, color field there. So again, um, I agree. I think that we'd like to see a mitigation plan. Um, we could decide as a board tonight to reopen, to vote to reopen the special permit um, and leave it open until we are satisfied that this is um, complete. Um, or we could uh, hold on reopening it if we are satisfied with what they come in front of us with um, on the 8th, we can uh, put some time um, time requirements for the execution of those items. Um, and if they are not met, we could reopen the special permit at that time. Uh, but I wanted to discuss the um, whether or not the board wanted to recommend reopening the special permit. And I'll start with Eugene, since you sighed heavily. I don't know the answer. Claire, do you have any like, opinion on whether we should reopen the special permit or not? Do I have any opinion? Yeah. Um, You've been talking to them. We haven't. That is that is an interesting question. I, um, I, I would like to give them the opportunity to respond. Um, I think that Rachel's suggestion that they come in on the 8th with an appropriate rendering and a mitigation plan, um, as well as some sort of explanation related to the distribution of the affordable units is, is good. Um, I, I think at this point, what they have committed to is, uh, at least in writing, is whatever mitigation this board thinks is appropriate, they will agree to perform. Um, and I think, you know, where we are right now, uh, we haven't offered them, you know, what, what we haven't told them yet what it is exactly that we're looking for. Um, but I think having them come in on the 8th and saying, you know, we, we are up to and including reopening the special permit is something under consideration. And, and the certificate of occupancy will be withheld for a moment? It's already been issued. Oh, right. um, again, uh, it can be pulled for um, non-compliance in the future. So the longer they let this go, the more um, challenging this will be for them. So what I would like to request, and in good faith, they have come back mm -hmm. quickly to say we will comply. But I think, again, um, they owe it to this town to come to the next meeting with the renderings and a schedule um, and a commitment for meeting all of these items that we just identified um, and uh, committing in, in writing to the um, to addressing these items which deviated from what was approved. Okay, I'm fine with that. Then. Steve? Yeah. Uh, just a, a question for Ms. Rickner. Um, yes. You earlier you said that the owners had residential tenants moving in this weekend? That's correct. Okay, thank you. That's my understanding. Uh, Jean? I, I don't know when their commercial tenant was moving in, but I, I understand they had a commercial tenant. Do you know? I have, I have heard they have a, um, uh, they do have a commercial tenant, yeah. um, but I do not know the timeline for them moving in and, and opening that business. Okay. I've, I've heard it's a gym. That's what I heard too. Yeah. Not, not the lucky one? Not the lucky gym, or not the lucky restaurant, no. Okay. okay. Um, so um, you have the list yes. to send to them. And if there's anything else, um, we will address that and expect them back at the January 8th At the January meeting. 8th meeting. And if I may offer one more thing, Mike Champa and I had a long discussion about um, this board and the special permit conditions of this board being included on their um, checklist of approvals prior to issuing an occupancy permit. And we have been added to that. I know we have been talking a lot about how we're going Great. to keep promises and things like that. Um, so this is a start. Um, at least we will have, I will have an opportunity, my team will have an opportunity to inspect the building or inspect Great. the facade um, Fantastic. prior to issuance of a permit in the future. It might be worth as well um, as a future item for us to build into, whether it's our rules and regulations or um, something else, what are the consequences for not complying with the special permit? Because obviously there are, um, fines and other items that are that the building department can levy for non-compliance with with certain um, uh, non-conformance issues that they have 
uh, but I don't know that we have those those levers, and that might be worth um, discussing with town council and um, inspectional services yeah. again, um, since this is not the first time. This is the most recent, the most egregious recently. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but um, it's something that I think we should, given that that will now be a checklist item, yeah. we should understand what the um, and be able to communicate clearly. Um, to the folks who come in front of us for a special permit exactly um, why they need to comply the with the conditions and the, and the particular um, elevations. And again, I, I think making sure that they know that at any time when, if, if things do change, you know, we can always review, um, you know, they can come in front of this board to, to discuss why and, and review and, and seek approval proactively. And that is certainly preferred to this particular yeah. situation that we all find ourselves in. Absolutely. Okay. Great. Um, so that concludes agenda item number five. We will now move, oh, excuse me, there was a, um, you also wanted to speak about 455, 457? Sure. So uh, the board asked, uh, for an update on 455 to 457 Mass Ave, um, it, as it appeared potentially maybe construction had stopped or um, it is underway. They are out there working um, through the winter as, as they can, but they're still moving forward um, with the project that is, um, you know, uh, moving moving through the system and moving along, I guess, according to schedule. Great. Thank you for the update. Any sure. questions for Claire around 455 to 457 Mass Ave? Great. Thank you so much for the update. Sure. All right. Uh, the next item is agenda nine, number six, which is Fox Library, 157 Mass Ave, a housing feasibility study, which is very exciting, yes. which I would love to Thank turn you. it over to you to discuss. So um, <clears throat> in our spare time this summer when we weren't working on MBTA communities, <laughs> my staff and I wrote a grant, um, the community one stop for growth. We received a community planning grant in the amount of um, about seventy-seven thousand dollars, seventy-seven thousand and some change, as well as um, direct uh, local technical assistance award from MAPC to complete a housing feasibility study above a future Fox Library. And this is something that is um, that Boston is starting to look at, and some other communities are starting to look at um, how to, you know, for for lack of uh, a lot of vacant public property that we could potentially use. Um, to build affordable housing or to build housing, you know, what could we do on properties that we own? So Anna uh, Litton um, uh, approached me about the idea of what if we put housing above a future uh, rebuilt Fox Library, and I thought it sounded really interesting. So we wrote this uh, feasibility grant, we were awarded, um, MAPC will be doing the work, um, and what they'll be looking at is um, essentially feasibility, you know, um, developing pro forma, um, you know, trying to take a look at um, disposition, you know, what would, what would uh, disposition of air rights, um, you know, what was the structure of that could look like, um, um, you know, how many units, how tall, um, what's the neighborhood impact with potential for parking underneath, um, just basically any question that may be uh, outstanding related to this project. And we don't know, honestly, if it is feasible or not, or if it's something that um, the town um, could take on. There are certainly lots of ways that this could be achieved, um, but I think what we're looking for is a path forward um, that works that works in Arlington and that works in the, the system that we have. So some, some really good news, and I think um, a, a, a pretty interesting um, project that we'll be taking on in the next few months. Great. Okay, any questions? On that? Uh, I looked at that a while back, <laughs> and you can probably fit in uh, many units up there uh, with no parking, and you can do it modularly, and you can sit anywhere from 12 to 16 units on top of the existing library. Mm -hmm. And you, you're doing the same thing what you're doing, what they're doing over the Papa Juno site. You're just poking a couple of uh, big uh, columns through, and that's it. Mm -hmm. and, it leaves uh, the library somewhat intact. Mm -hmm. uh, that was in the, that is pure, just air rights, and they can set that up as an RFP yeah. and uh, sell the air rights. Yeah. That could be a possibility. I'm not saying that only way to go, but I just remember looking at that a long time ago. Great. Before I put up this app, I don't look at that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ken. Gina. Um, you might 
consider talking with Joe Backer at the oh. Boston Mayor's Office of Housing. He has been staffing their um, their housing over library um, applications and um, is I'm, would I'm sure be happy to discuss. Uh, they just awarded their West End Library site um, just I think last week. Oh, so wow. uh, I think they have been finding it hugely expensive, mm. um, but but the sites that they've been putting out. Um, for RFP are very challenging sites, mm. so, um, so for what it's worth. Great tip, thank you. Gene. Yeah, this is terrific. I'm really glad you got the grant and are looking into this, so congratulations. Um, is the Fox Library building itself going to be rebuilt too? So this could be part of a whole package sort of thing? It's my understanding that the library building will be demolished and rebuilt. Rebuilt. So yes. this would allow for some more opportunities. That's, that's Correct. great. For the housing itself, what are you thinking? Like a percent affordable? If it can't work financially as affordable? Will we do market rate? What, right. what, what's your thought about that? So at this point? I think the feasibility study will, um, you know, point us in the right direction. What I would like to see is enough units above the library that we could do deeply affordable, 30% AMI, um, mm -hmm. you know, 50% AMI, um, those uh, those type of units. I think you know the parking requirements would be less, um, and I think that um, you know ultimately you would need quite a bit of subsidy in there. We would have right. to. Right. I'm not sure the schedule would work given the way that the that projects like that are funded, you know, with going into the rounds with EOHLC, um, the, you know, the, the subsidy rounds. Um, so it may be a project that is market with um, our inclusionary zoning. That's what I was wondering. Is oh, absolutely applicable. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is great. So I'm looking forward to see how this rolls out. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Jean. Steve? So I um, attended the Affordable Housing Trust Board's meeting last week, and we actually got into a very deep in the weeds <laughs> <laughs> discussion about this. Um, I'm glad to see uh, that we were able to get a TA grant um, because you know of the things I learned in the meeting in terms of you know what needs to be ironed out, but in terms of air rights, the number of developers, how the asset classes are negotiated for in terms of funding. Um, I'm glad we have some funding to figure all this out, but it is a very exciting project. Great. Great. Thank you, Steve. And congratulations. Thank you. All right. Uh, anything else on item six? All right. Um, is there anyone who would like to speak at Open Forum in our audience tonight? All right. We will close Open Forum um, and move to number eight, new business. Claire. Anything on your list for new business? Um, no new business at this time. Fantastic. Ken, we introduce Sarah. Yes. Go ahead, Ken. See so this project here across the street? Yes. Part of the approval process was there was going to be there was supposed to be a tree here. <laughs> okay. There was a tree there. Oh. It died and they cut it and brought and they threw it away. So we need to, so part of the promise keeping is they need to install the tree there. Yes, it was a real small weak tree. Oh. It was like maybe a one inch caliber tree that kind of, I don't know. It, Spring it, is coming. Yeah. Yes. So if Spring we, is coming, plant the tree. Can I ask if we look into uh, asking them to put a, a bigger tree there? Sure. Uh, if you go back to the original approval plans for this, there was one decorative tree, ornamental tree, right at that corner. Fair question. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to follow One tree up. at a time. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I just saw this and I'm going to go. Oh, great. <laughs> great question, Ken. All right. Anyone else? New business? Nothing. All right. Is there a motion to adjourn? So motioned. I'll second that. We'll take a roll call vote starting with Steve. Yes. Jean. Yes. Shana. Yes. Ken. Yes. And I'm a yes as well. We are adjourned. Right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a happy new year.